sounds from the rhythm underground. Welcome to the We Love Guitar Nerds podcast. Your place for all things guitar. We have your interviews, we have your lessons, your boomer discussions, and your verbal rabble rousings. So please hit subscribe, share, and like to join our constantly growing musical community. Welcome to the We Love Guitar Nerds podcast. I'm Rod Gels, your host, and today we have Mark Chatfield, native of Columbus, Ohio. You may have heard of Mark Chatfield, a rock and roll machine called The Gods, G-O-D-S or Z? Z. That was, that was Z. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, uh, or you might have heard of him from Rosie. Or there's this guy up north named Bob Seeger that had a silver bullet band. We got lots to talk about. First of all, thank you, Mark. This is an honor. Where did you, where did all this start from you? Your, your musical journey. Where did it begin? Um, you know, it, that that's actually a pretty easy question. Um, it began when I when I saw the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show, mm -hmm. and uh, at that point in time, I think I must have been seven or eight years old. And uh, at that point in time, I decided what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. It was a... <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, I didn't get a uh, I didn't get a guitar until I was around 12. OK, uh, but I would pick up anything and everything that looked like one. All right. You know, rooms. My grandparents had a uh, uh, a pool table. So pool cues, mm -hmm. you know, anything Tennis like rackets. that to pretend I was playing guitar. <laughs> Tennis rackets. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly snow shovel yeah. <laughs> uh, but um <laughs> then i finally uh, i finally got a guitar uh when i was 12 years old and it was a um a sears silver tone out of the sears catalog mm -hmm. one of those uh like like just f hole acoustic guitars and i kind of started teaching myself to play guitar uh after that was well, that like 1968 is what we're saying right about there probably about 1960 how does one teach themselves in 1968 that's a good question. Um, I, uh, th this is funny because I remember doing it. I, I, you know, I'd carry the guitar everywhere the day I got it. So, you know, I, of course I carried it into the John with me and uh, I, I don't even know how it got tuned, but it must've been tuned because I sat there and I was strumming on the strings and all of a sudden I, str I started strumming the, the E and the B string and I started playing happy together by the turtles that okay. da, 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 I actually really yeah. played on guitar. Uh -huh. I just taught it myself, uh, taught it to my to myself like that. There was actually a kid uh, that lived down the street from me in Grove City. Uh, his name was Greg Rogers. He had a guitar and he knew how to play some. So yeah. he would teach me some chords here and there. Okay. So he and was then, kind of your kind of your first mentor? kinda yeah yeah, yeah kinda no one kids know, in the he, neighborhood he was, he was he was not real happy about teaching me chords but he did okay um and then my mom bought me uh i she bought me the beatles complete music book okay so that had to be 68 early 69 the problem with that is and i didn't realize it till many years later those are written for piano i know i knew what you're gonna say <laughs> yeah so i'm playing everything like in in flats mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and I'm trying to tell people I know how to play these songs. They're going, "No, that's not how it is." You know, you're not supposed to be playing an E flat, a D flat, yeah. and blah yeah. blah blah. So it was a, uh, it it was challenging. Yeah. Um, and basically, I would just pick it up from anybody I knew how to play guitar. Mm -hmm. You know, I would say, "Teach me this, teach me that." And once I learned a few chords, I'd just go woodshed in my bedroom, listening to records, mm -hmm. and uh, and try to pick things up. All right. Um, my mom is very musical. She plays piano. My sister plays plays piano also. They're mm -hmm. both really good piano players. So I guess it runs in my family a little bit. So, you know, I've always been able to kind of play by ear. Yes, I guess you could say. So having a good ear certainly didn't hurt. It no. Absolutely. Though. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So uh, how long was it before you started playing with other people? Um, when I had that guitar, I actually... Uh, Greg, the guy down the street, um, play, you know, that played, we had a drummer around the corner, our paper boy named Ernie Coachman. 
and then another guy named Jeff Snyder that had a guitar mm -hmm. and uh, Greg Rogers actually had an electric guitar. The rest of us just had acoustic guitars. Mm -hmm. And we put together a band uh, in Ernie's basement where we used to practice. And that band was called the Bottled Snowstorm. The Bottled Snowstorm. Yeah, we never played anywhere but the basement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. most and, of my bands. And, and I can't imagine how horrible we probably were, but but we had fun. You yeah, know? yeah. And you could go back and, and you know, sixth and seventh grade and tell people, yeah, man, I'm in a band. And yeah. uh, we did play the talent show, I guess. Somebody reminded me of that. We played the sixth grade talent show and we played Little Black Egg or something and, and we actually won. <laughs> so Yeah, I don't know the Little Black Egg. Which uh, It was a real, when I was a kid, that was the first song you really learned. It was by a band called the Nightcrawlers. Okay. And it has a really defined lick. It goes da 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 Okay. It's A, E, and A, E, and D. Okay. And it's a super easy song to learn, and everybody played it. So, yeah, when when we get done with this, Google Little Black Well, it's already written down. Yeah, that was that was the song du jour when I was a kid. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Okay, so Bottled Snowstorm, Did what other covers would you guys checking out? Oh gosh, I you know, I think we probably played stuff like Louie Louie. Um, I know that we, oh gosh, um, I know we had some other kid come over one time. Uh, his name was Don Hill. It's his brother John played guitar, and mm -hmm. the rumor around school was his brother knew how to play Purple Haze. All right, so, so he we was, had him he was come royalty. over to try to teach us how to play purple haze but he really didn't know how to play it either and and we were biting off way more than we could chew at that point in time mm -hmm. and i think we might have we might have you know rumbled around with um uh like uh oh shoot born to be wild probably because okay. if you play that wrong it's pretty easy to play down in the first e position mm -hmm. so it was any anything we could play that with the a and d in it how to play bar chords at that point in time okay <laughs> anything with the a and d in it Pretty much, maybe a C here and there. Okay. Um, I had a when I was first starting to learn to play guitar, I had a bitch of a time with a D chord for some reason. I could not get my ring finger to play the D chord, so I would play it with just with just the E and the B string, and uh, you know, and kind of mute the rest of the strings. And All right. Like I used to it just seemed like it took me forever to get that chord. Down. <laughs> I don't know why. Mine was probably mine was, still have problems with it. I don't know. Mine was C and F. F is was also horrible. Yeah, yeah. So okay, yeah. so how long was it before you uh okay, you, you bottled snowstorm? You had other like painless expression. Yeah, the bottled snowstorm. Um, you know, everybody kind of went off and did their own stuff. It like I said, it was after just the talent show basement. Uh -uh. Um, and what happens is, you know, when you're in a, you know, Grove City is kind of a small town. So it's that's, not where, so you're, small that's where you're from. Yeah, I'm from Grove City, Ohio. OK. And um, it's kind of a small town. Like I said, it's not so small anymore. But, you know, when you're in the grade school or junior high school, word gets out, you know, who plays instruments and things mm -hmm. like that. It's super you know, easy to find other people. So word got out that I play guitar. So right around seventh grade, uh, which is the beginning of junior high school, um, I was, I ran into some guys there, um, named, uh, a guy named C.R. Quinn, who was a drummer. Mm -hmm. And then I think the other guitar player was Danny Barr. And then a guy named Jim Sammons. I can't remember. I believe I remember these names. I, yeah. Uh, that's I'm all these impressed. years ago. <laughs> and, uh, we kind of started getting together. C.R. actually had a really nice Ludwig drum set. Mm hmm and Jim had uh, Jim had an electric guitar. Danny had electric guitar, and I, I I still had my acoustic guitar. But I was actually the singer in that band. Okay. So you, I don't. When did you did you sing before you played guitar? Yeah, I guess. I guess everybody does, right? Yeah, you know, I was of course, you know, when I still went to church, I was in the church choir. Okay. You know, but so, you sang yeah. along with the radio, and you you did all the like what everybody does. Exactly. I, I can remember going over to my old elementary school during the summer and I would, they had this awesome swing set back there that they'd never put up in a, in a school anymore. Cause you, could, oh, yeah, yeah, cause I mean, of, you, you know, it was chains and rubber yeah. and you know, you could go, we'd go way up in the air and we'd jump out into the Fair gravel, hard. you know, like, 
like they wouldn't do anymore. Yeah. But anyway, I can remember going over there and just singing Beatles. I'd be the only person in the playground. I'd be singing Beatles songs at the top of my lungs on that swing set. So that was the Beatles were kind of your first your your gateway band. Yeah, I at that point in time, I was far more a Beatles fan than a Rolling Stones fan. Okay. I can't say I'm that way now. It's kind of 50 50. Yeah, yeah. Which I is not much. Of, I'm that way too, but there's not much. There are not many people like us. Yeah, yeah. That's it, usually a polarizing. <laughs> yeah, I can go, man. Your Beatles are your stones. Way, you know, yeah. it, on any given day, I, and I think, I think if you put songs side by side, I might like more Rolling Stone songs than I like Beatles songs. Mm -hmm. But I mean, part of it's because you know, I my musical direction kind of went more Stones ish. Mm -hmm. the Beatles ish and probably for no other reason than it was a lot easier than to play than the the real produced Beatles stuff. right so, right um but I was I was addicted to anything music I would watch all of the hullabaloo shows that were on tv mm -hmm. shindig I mean I would not miss an episode of any of that stuff and then during the summer um instead of being out playing at noon, I'd rush home and, and watch where the action is. Okay. Which uh, was Dick Clark's show. I think it was on ABC. And that's where, um, that that's where uh, Paul Revere and the Raiders got their start. They were like the house band on where the action is. Okay. And then they'd have other bands, but anything, anything to do with music. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, so when did you start, when, when did you start cresting over the, the, the beginner ish garagey, three chord stuff to like, uh, this guy can play. Um, that was kind of the band I was describing with Danny Barr and, and yeah. Jim Sammons and CR. CR kind of lost interest in playing drums. Jim kind of lost interest in, uh, in, uh, in playing guitar. And Danny had hooked up with, with a couple of other guys, um, a guy named Steve Schaefer and a guy named Doug DeWeese. Okay. And they ended up calling me and then I went back to starting to play guitar again at that point. And that was the beginning of the painless expression. Okay. So we had, uh, we rehearsed in Doug DeWeese's basement. At that point in time, I'd finally gotten my first electric guitar, which was a, uh, a, K, a K speed demon, single pickup red K speed demon that I still have. All right. And, uh, and a Va or a, uh, sorry, Va I wish I would have had a Vox amp. I had a Silvertone Twin 12 amplifier that uh i sold a, a shotgun that was i that i inherited from my grandfather and i sold the shotgun to buy that amplifier all right and the guitar i actually mowed lawns all summer long to pay for half of the guitar all right, all right. that was the deal with my parents mm -hmm. so um we started we started practicing and, and i still think we probably were terrible but we were learning all kinds of other songs at that anything that was on the radio at that point you know mm -hmm. um what comes to mind, like trying to do let it be without, you know, without a piano. Yeah. Um, he ain't heavy. He's my brother, you know, that kind of, that kind of stuff. Well, we, we actually ended up, our dads were kind of our managers and road crew because none of us could drive, you know, we're all like 12, 13 years mm -hmm. old and we got hooked up and I can't tell you how, but we got hooked up with a DJ named Dave Logan from the AM radio station well, actually, then there was only AM radio All right, yeah, yeah. in Columbus, and he did these sock hops, like he at like Lockbourne Air Base. You'd play there. You'd play at uh, Cook Recreation Center, all the recreation centers, swimming pools, and stuff like that. So we got hooked up with him, and we got these. Uh, Steve's dad uh, worked in the men's department at a big department store called Lazarus here. Okay, and uh, got us all matching suits. So we had all these ma these matching suits, and we were actually working every week. Wow! You know, I'm making you know I'm playing two nights, making 50, 60 bucks at twelve years old, and which is and, which is a, know, this like is nineteen sixty nine seventy. You know, nineteen seventy, and, I'm, I'm like, and in, in many places in the United States, the wage did not go up. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 They make less now. Yeah. Two thousand twenty two wages. Or, yeah. it matter. So. Um, that kind of that kind of happened. I remember we we got sponsored the, the second summer we got sponsored by Coca Cola, and we had to wear white shirts with these Coca Cola bell bottoms. All right, had Coke logos all over them. I wish I still had those. I don't. 
Yeah. Uh, but I do have a picture of the painless expression with us all with all our suits on and stuff. Okay. You, you got to um, hear that. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, yeah. It's, uh, I, I don't even know where it is, but I have pictures. I think I have a copy yeah. of them on my yeah. Facebook page or something. But anyway, um, that band went on for about a year, year and a half, I think, something mm -hmm. like that. And, you know, I'm 13 and, you know, everything in my mind and body and everything is starting to change. And, you know, and I'm kind of a defiant, not as bad as I was, but I'm, I was kind of, of a defiant rebel kind of a kid. All right. And those guys were all pretty conservative. And so we all had kind of, you know, we all bangs and stuff, but I started letting my hair grow longer. Mm -hmm. And how did that go musical, over? Huh? How did that go over with your parents? And <laughs> um, my parents, my dad hated it, uh, especially you know, I played football during that time. You know, I was still kind of between being a musician and a jock because mm -hmm. uh, my dad's kind of a jock. And, you know, I played basketball and I played football, little league football and all mm -hmm. that stuff like that. But when I started growing my hair long, he wasn't he wasn't liking that. And I can remember after a football game, him marching me to the to the uh, uh, to the barbershop because I had the longest hair on the football team and it embarrassed him. Mm. And I was like covering my ears. But then after that, they kind of just gave up on it. And I, I started, started growing it long. The, the big argument happened at Steve Schaefer's house at, at a practice when those guys wanted to learn. Do you remember a song called Hitch and a Ride? It's kind of bubble gummy. You look okay. at, look that one up too. Okay. It's called Hitch and a Ride. I know I Hitch and a Ride, but it ain't the same one. I can't remember who it was by. Okay. Uh, they wanted to do it. Yeah, they want to do that, and I wanted to learn Mississippi Queen. Okay, well that that was your uh, was that your uh, for your love? <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. That was it, your line it, in the sand. <laughs> it, it was. It was, and a big argument ensued over the length of my hair and the direction. I mean, these guys are all listening, you know, to all this the radio stuff. Yeah. By that point in time, I was listening to. Uh, uh, you know, I had, are you experienced? I had the first Led Zeppelin album. I had the mm -hmm. second Led Zeppelin album, yeah. blind faith. You know, I, I had, I, I was way ahead of them. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just went a, a different musical direction. Well, yeah. Yeah. Anymore. You weren't just bubblegum. No, no. Bubblegum. I was, I was getting far more progressive than, than, than they were. So um, me and one of the fathers, actually Steve Schaefer's dad, kind of had it out, you know, and I'm standing here and I'm 13 year old, years old. And I, and I looked at him, I said, well, fuck you then. And they fired me. Okay. So I, I hope you do have to, you have to bleep that. Am I allowed to say? You're allowed to curse. Okay, cool. <laughs> so I got fired Yeah. from that band. So I went home, told my parents I got fired and, you know, it just was the way it was. Yeah. The next week we're in junior high school and there was another band in junior high school called the Purple Dome. Okay. Uh, but it's P U R P I L L. Ooh, okay. psychedelic. All right. So uh, <laughs> they they had they knew about me because my band, The Painless Expression, had actually played at the school a couple of times. Mm -hmm. We used to play in the Commons area in the morning before school, and because everybody thought it was so neat that we had a band and we all dressed the same and blah 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 blah. blah. So uh, this guy named Dave Girth called me and said, "Hey, you want to come join our band?" Cause they were like the bad boys. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I went over to Dave Girth's basement and, um, and practiced with them. And, and I joined the band and they were doing, you know, they were doing Steppenwolf and Creedence Clearwater. And we were toying with Black Sabbath and, mm -hmm. you know, all the stuff that I just loved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was, that was the beginning of uh, that. That was the beginning of rebel Mark. <laughs> all right. All right. So what happens to the painless expression once rebel Mark is, ousted that's kind of a funny story um two weeks later i get a call from steve schaefer's dad who says because i was i was actually in the pants expression i did most of the singing and i played rhythm guitar okay Danny Barr was the lead guitarist okay. in the band even though we argued about solos sometimes we did hey joe bad version of hey joe by the hendrix version yeah and i always wanted to do the solo and he wanted to do the solo and we would argue about it but um yeah. Steve Schaefer's dad called me back and said, hey, how would you like to come back to the band and play lead? And uh, I guess 
once I was gone, they figured out that Danny Barr really couldn't play guitar very well. Because you're holding Danny, down the fort. If you fort. see this, I'm sorry. So uh, you're holding down the fort. Pretty much, yeah. And and I don't think it's good he couldn't play lead very well. I think it's because he couldn't play rhythm and, and carry the band. And I kind of could. Yeah. So he quit, and they wanted me to come back, and I I just said no. Said I'm happy where I am. Mm -hmm. So that was they got some. Uh, they had some guy come in to replace me and they stayed around, I don't know, for not very much longer. Yeah. And uh, and then that was the end of them. So then the Purple Dome went through a, a lot of different uh, a, a lot of different members over the time, you know, that we were in early high school and, you know, played the dance here and there and stuff like that. And mostly just practiced in Dave Girth's basement. Mm -hmm. So uh, his mom, his mom was divorced. And we kind of, uh, so she's a single mom raising two teenage boys. Oh boy. And that was kind of the hang. We kind of okay. ran the house, if you okay. know. <laughs> Got away with so this that. This is you're around 13 years old, 12, 13? 13, 14, probably early into 15. Okay. In that band. And, okay. uh, and then we, I mean, we started getting, you know, way, way heavier. You know, we were doing like, uh, you know, the live side or the, uh, the, um, oh, the my generation side of live at Leeds, mm -hmm. you know, and we were doing black Sabbath and uh, I'm, I'm still a huge black Sabbath fan to this day. Um, and, and Steppenwolf and anything that was, you know, not super radio friendly. Yeah. You know, we were already picking the alternative tracks from the Creedence Clearwater records instead of doing yeah, yeah. Instead you of know, Susie Q for 20 minutes instead of doing proud Mary. And that's you know, that, 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 that kind of thing. So in this purple dome, is this where you are you starting to work more on the lead guitar stuff? Yes, um, that band originally had a lead guitar player who uh, who left the band because he was on the high school football team and just didn't have time and he wasn't into it anymore. And so I became the lead guitarist because we were only we became a three piece with a singer at that point in time. OK, were so you, I played, were you the singer I played in this one? Piece. Huh? Were you the singer in this one? No, we had a singer named Greg Patterson okay. who ended up leaving the band eventually. And then, yes, I became the singer. It was just Dave Girth, myself and various drummers. So how quickly, so once you started working on your lead guitar stuff, how quickly is this, does this start to shape up? Um, pretty quickly. Cause I'd always kind of worked on it. Okay. You know, I, I just kind of like being thrown in, into it. You need that in order to. Yeah. And, and, you know, when I was learning stuff in my bedroom, I was having a lot more fun playing the lead parts than I was, you know, the rhythm guitar parts. And mm -hmm. those were back in the days I used to listen. I used to listen to the, uh, the Woodstock album religiously because there's so much great stuff on there. Between, yeah. you know, my goal was to learn I'm going home. You oh, know, yeah, yeah. Alvin Lee thing yep. and the Who the on after. there. And then when two came out, Mountain was on there. So I listened to that stuff all the time. Same with your early influences like Leslie West. Oh yeah. Big time. Leslie yeah, West. I'm, Leslie Ali. West is a huge influence on me. So is Pete Townsend, mm -hmm. um, Mick Ralphs. I yep. mean, the list can go on and on and on. Yeah. Guy, uh, the shoot the guy, what's what's his name from, uh, uh, from trapeze. Uh, oh shoot. Tommy I can't Bolin. think of his name. Was I'm sorry. Tommy, Tommy Boland. Was he in trapeze? No, no uh gosh i'll think of his name here um i keep thinking lee pickens but no he was in blood rock uh okay. i'll think of it anyway um so you know it's back when you had a record player that would you know had had three speeds on it six or four speeds 16 33 45 and 78 mm -hmm. so you know you'd put your record player on 16 and slow the solos down to half speed and then, right. you know, of course, scratch it back to relearn it because you just have to keep playing it over and over. Yeah. So, of course, I ruined all my early records. Yep. Um, but uh, but that's that's kind of the way you did it. And mm -hmm. and then I just I'd go watch people and just learn what I could from from whoever I could. I I didn't take lessons and uh, other than, you know, saying, hey, show me how to do this. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and to this day, I regret it. Okay. I, I really, I really wish I would have. What, what access did you have to people? What, like in 1969 and 71? <laughs> um, there were a couple of really good guitar players in my school. 
Okay. Uh, a guy named like Steve Breckenridge, who I didn't really bond with too much, but there was another guy named Rich Hill okay. who would come down and jam with us sometimes. Mm-hmm. And I would actually, I, I would actually learn a lot from him. Yeah. And then, you know, and I probably learned as much from watching guys play on television, you know, mm-hmm. that, that, than, uh, than I did from being in person with people yeah. until, until later on. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, when, like guitar teachers back where well, I'm thinking early seventies, a lot of them were really conservative there. Yeah. They, they were conservative and regimented, you know, you wanted, they wanted you to learn scales and things yeah. like that. And did you ever go through that? No, no, we, um, we really didn't have a teacher in Grove city. Okay. Um, too much. And, uh, and once again, I just, I was even while well, in high school, I was even in the st- stage slash jazz band. I played guitar okay. in a stage band. I couldn't read any of those chords. Yeah. You know, I faked my way through it for three years. Mm-hmm. You know, I would play, uh, I would, if it said, you know, C major seventh or something, I'd just play the root chord yeah. and I just play the C and kind of fake my way through mm-hmm. it. You know, we were, we were though lucky that we had a pretty progressive uh, band director band director there and our, our stage band, which actually won a lot of awards. We were doing, uh, uh, oh gosh, we did uh, 40, 40,000 headmen by traffic. All right. um, and then, then he brought in peaches on regalia, which is a Frank, Frank Zappa song. Yeah. Yep. And uh-huh. he was amazed that I already knew how to play it because uh, the, the mother's life, mother's life at the Fillmore, nineteen seventy, is one of my favorite albums mm-hmm. still to this day. Yeah, and Peaches on Regalia is on that album. Yeah, and I had learned it from that record, and he was like blown away that I already knew yeah. how to play the song. Of course, for the band, we did it in, in, the, in a different key because yeah. there were horns involved. But uh, no marimbas. But yeah, he was pretty progressive with that kind of stuff. Yeah, you had no marimba in your band. I'm I'm guessing. Had what? <laughs> you had no, no marimba? marimba. Yeah. No, no, did not. <laughs> did not. <laughs> Or bells or whatever. Zappa's big on the percussion on that. Yeah, oh, big time, big time. So this Purple Dome, does that become E Pluribus Unum? Yeah, we did, it, that was the same band. We just changed the name. Okay. And actually, my mom thought of that name. That's wonderful. <laughs> and uh, we had uh, my, I, I have somewhere, somebody gave me decades ago an E Pluribus Unum, Unum business card. And we had business cards because we had kind of this fake manager guy and we never really we played like i said we played at some school functions uh for my school and maybe one of the other high schools in the area and then we played in a couple of battle of the bands that we'd always end up coming in like second because there'd be some band there whose parents bought them you know vox amps and rickenbackers and gibsons and you know we had a bunch of stuff we threw together kids yeah yeah that still happens oh yeah 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 i mean the rich rich kid family there's a, a Facebook page for uh, like, it's called Central Ohio Scrapbook or something. Yeah. And they show all these bands from the sixties and, you know, all these kids have, you know, Vox Super Beatles and yeah. Roland Fleet Customs. And I always root for the ones that aren't that way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we were, we were the Grove City poor kids. Yeah. That's yeah. who I root for. <laughs> yep. <laughs> to yep. this day, because that's a thing. That's a thing is like, you know, the rich kids are always getting, they're always winning it because they have social pool but they don't have the talent nor the, yeah. No, some of them could play, but they looked way better. Yeah. You know, they, pre- they presented better. They weren't out there in a, in a, in a tank top and torn up jeans, mm-hmm. you know, which, which we were. Yeah. And, and we all needed a haircut, okay. you know, with, with probably, you know, with probably flagrant acne. You yeah. know? <laughs> so the, uh, so your teenage years, you're going from band to band about a year, year and a year and a half for each band. Yeah. It, it seems like it was forever, but most of them were only about that long. And yeah. that band, that band dissolved for, for several, for, for several reasons. Uh-huh. Um, I had, uh, I had met my, my girlfriend at the time. Um, she and, and the drummer's cousin who went to a different high school came down to see us practice that was always the thing, you know, you'd invite people to come down and watch you practice. Of course. You know, and we'd have our, 
we'd have our uh, our stolen our stolen floodlight light show going, you know, mm-hmm. with some some you know gel paper in front of them and blah blah blah. Uh, but um, I met her when she came down there, and she was from a different high school, uh, not too far from mine. But so I ended up meeting a bunch of people from a school called Franklin Heights. Well. Also during that time is when I had, when I just really started discovering drugs. <laughs> and uh, so I was either, you know, I, I, all during high school, I was on LSD. I mean, I, I tripped my brains out from about 10th, 10th grade on. Mm-hmm. And uh, the other guys in the band kind of weren't digging that, the fact that I was doing that. So you, you were, that was a bad boy band, but it wasn't a bad boy band. <laughs> no, Dave, Dave, the bass player, uh, he was kind of straight arrow as far as that went. He would drink, yeah. but the drugs thing was kind of not his yeah. thing. Yeah. So I, that kind of, I don't remember how it dissolved, but it kind of did. Um, and they started actually that, that guy told you Rich Hill kind of replaced me in that band. Okay. And then I ended up, I started off, I started, I met a guy through my girlfriend at the time named Tom Fritz, who was a bass player okay. uh, on the West side of Columbus. And he was a couple of years older than me. So he had a car, he had a job, he had graduated from high school. And uh, he came over to my house once and we started, he, we started playing guitar a little bit. And after that, he would come after he'd get off work. He was a barber <laughs> of all things yeah. after he would get off work. He would drive to my house and pick me up and we go to his house on the West side and we would sit down and we would listen. That guy turned me on to so much music that I ha- was not aware of at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, that's when I got into uh, trapeze. Okay. He was really into three piece bands. Uh, the trapeze. trapeze um, tell us who trapeze is for those who. Those who do Glenn, I know Glenn Hughes is a part of it. Glenn, Glenn Hughes and and the guy that was that ended up being the drummer and Judas Priest was the drummer. Okay. And um, for the life of me, I cannot think of the guitar player's name. And he he passed away not too long ago. He's a really good guitar player. And he actually played on, he actually co-wrote and played on the the White Snake album that has uh, Still of the Night on it. Okay. Um, gosh, I brain dead with that, but I'll I'll think of it um so yeah trapeze i mean anybody out there listening go get the trapeze medusa album mel galley mel galley yeah there you go yeah. trapeze medusa album and uh uh you are the music we're just the band two great records mm-hmm. oh my god they're so good e- early zz top uh he had the first zz top album okay. uh slade he turned me on to slade i had no mm-hmm. idea who they were at that yeah. point david bowie early david bowie band called uh remember we've done some songs by a band called sir lord baltimore um then uh uh, early jay giles you know like the full house Mm -hmm. really they were their early stuff and people you know center so we would we would go to his house and we would just woodshed and learn this stuff Mm -hmm. so uh that's the band that became zark with okay and that that is a name that, that means absolutely nothing Mm-hmm. Uh, we had a drummer for a while named Dave Tilly who went to Ohio State and uh, he would come to practice and we r- didn't really have a name and he had just seen that movie called Zardoz and uh, he goes man I you know I really like that movie he says we should call the band like Zarquith and and that's really how it came up All right <laughs> so then he didn't stay in the band very long and we ended up uh, with a guy named Tim Pendergast who was uh, who was friends with my girlfriend and Tom Fritz, another West Side guy, yeah. and a singer named Dave Blakely. Okay. And uh, who ended up a uh, big, heavy guy with really long hair, um, ended up being a like in, in the Outlaws or some kind of biker gang or something. Okay, gotcha. So uh, that band actually played out, you know, once again, we played some high school dances at my high school and at mm-hmm. Tom's uh, old high school. And, you know, we play like the Grove City Community Fair and stuff like that. But, and, and we were, you know, we were playing songs nobody wanted to hear. You know, nobody wanted to hear a Robin Trower song or a, or a Mop the Hoople song. Yeah. You know, they, wanted to, they wanted to hear, you know, 
the Doobie Brothers and Bachman Turner Overdrive, okay. and, you know, the stuff that was on the radio. Yeah. So once again, I'm in a good, a band that's pretty good, but not very popular. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Musicians uh, liked it though. Yeah. Yeah. I right. mean, we, we played to please ourselves yeah. pretty much. And that's why we didn't work very much. Yeah. Um, I don't know if we were any good or not. By, by that point in time, I was starting to get some good gear with Tom's help because he had a job. Okay. And uh, uh, I ended up, I, gosh, he bought me a, an SG special, uh, Gibson SG special. And then uh, I ended up getting, I had a, a dual showman cabinet that I ended up trading for, traded for a Marshall head, a Marshall 100 watt head. And uh, gosh, that guitar morphed in. That's when, that's when I really started to, to buy and sell and trade guitars. Which, yeah, that's that, part of your story that I want to. Yeah, wanna... that, that SG, <laughs> actually started a little before then, but that FG, SG morphed into many guitars. Yeah. Did you, um, you ever get rid of it? 35 into a Dan Armstrong. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I don't remember how that band actually broke up or quit playing um i i'm not i i don't i just plain don't remember uh okay. drugs and alcohol probably have a lot to do with that i was i was actually drinking pretty heavy during that period of time too okay um but we uh we just ended up just going separate ways so i i, I had graduated from high school by then and I didn't want to start college for a year. So I started, uh, I, I worked a job at a, at a, at a t-shirt printing place called uh, Fraternity Sportswear. So I started out being a screen printer, a uh, silk screen printer out All of right. high school. And then I ended up getting, uh, for one thing or another, I ended up getting transferred to the shipping department, which was, uh, which was actually, a actually a godsend. Okay. Um, what, what had happened is we, we, we shipped, uh, they printed everything, t-shirts, glassware, mm -hmm. and they would ship to fraternities and sororities all over the United States. Yeah. So back then, you know, we'd have to pack the stuff up. We'd ship some UPS, um, ship some by truck, but then some went Greyhound. So I would take the Greyhound stuff down to the Greyhound office uh, in downtown Columbus so I knew I'd have some time to waste because I could tell them, you know, traffic was bad or blah, blah, blah. So I, there was a music store down there called Whitey Lunzar's Music. Okay. Uh, about two blocks from Greyhound. So I knew a guy that worked there named Dino Bradley. And so I would go start hanging out there. I'd go down there for another hour and just hang out at the, at the music store, mm -hmm. you know, before I went back to work. Um, one thing, one thing led to another. I ended up, um, I ended up being laid off at the t-shirt place. So I, uh, and I'd been there, maybe it was probably the late summer. So I'd been there maybe six months or something. And so I'd go down and hang at Whitey Lunsars and they ended up offering me a job because not only, I mean, I was a guitar player, but I also, even at that point, I, I knew quite a bit about equipment because I'm, I've always been, I've like always that. been one of those guys, Yeah. you know, if I get a new guitar, a new amplifier, the first thing I do is take it apart. Okay. You know, I want to see what's inside. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, what's and literature, you know, I'd send away for literature and catalogs and stuff. And I'd cut the pictures out, put them up on my wall of stuff I wanted and mm -hmm. things like that. So I've always been obsessed with it. And they kind of they kind of knew that, you know, I knew as much as any salesman down there about the stuff they were selling. So um, so they gave me a job down there and then I ended up playing. Dino had a band. Dino's kind of a, a he unfortunately passed away a few years ago, but he had kind of a kind of a Dino, a, a blues rock kind of a band. OK. And he needed a bass player. So I switched to bass. And played bass for the Dino Bradley band for a mm -hmm. while. And, you know, we played out some, had this great drummer named Bimbo Brown. And uh, he's, uh, I talked to him not too long ago, but he's a great, great drummer. But anyway, that band, I don't, once again, I don't know how that band folded. I know there's some recordings of it. We actually went in the recording studio mm -hmm. in Columbus and, and did a couple of songs. And what uh, was your, what was the first time you recorded? Was that? Probably 19, late 74. Okay early 70 it was at late 74 okay uh, we went to this um 
little little studio called Dino Saturday Bradley in Columbus. I don't know if those tapes exist or not. I think we did two originals of Dino's. Okay. And like I said, I'm the bass player on them. Um, and then I, you know, I was still messing around with guitar there, and that band kind of wasn't doing anything. And Dino quit the quit Lunzars to go work somewhere else. So I end up joining a band called um, Borrowed Time with a guy named Ed Whitney, who also worked at Whitey Lunzars. Their guitar player had quit. He asked me to, to come play guitar. Well, that band actually worked a lot. Okay. They were part of the Fraternity Managers Association. So okay. we played frat parties virtually every weekend. And then we actually got into the Sugar Shack and we played played the Sugar Shack, which was the place to play mm -hmm. and played the Agora with mm -hmm. that band. And it, it was, a, you know, for a bar band, we were kind of successful, you know. So what kind um, of what kind of material were you doing? That band, I actually have a recording of that band. Mm -hmm. um, Ed had a studio in his basement and our rehearsals, we'd rehearse in the studio and we'd mic everything up and we'd rehearse with headphones on. Yeah, stuff yeah. like a, in a studio environment. Yeah. And we made a demo tape and uh, and I have a copy of it on, on actually I have it on CD now, but I had a cassette of it all these years. And we it's got. Uh, let's see. Um, can't get enough of, of your love. The bad company can't get okay. enough. Um, it's got. Uh, oh, shoot. I'm trying to remember what else it has on it uh you did some radio stuff yeah some radio stuff there's a rolling stone song on it um mm -hmm. uh i can't remember which one and then there's a uh, uh Black, flying burrito brothers i think it's six days on the road is okay. that, what that song's called um and i think there might be a jay giles song on it okay and our actually our our singer chick could play pretty good harp so we could do we could get away playing guy all songs correctly okay yeah um and uh you know yes it was it was it was more commercial but with some you know some stuff that you know was a little off the wall but yeah. by that point in time i realized that if you wanted to work you had to play more commercial stuff yeah. so um, the jay guile stuff should be noted that their early stuff was a lot different than what they became oh yeah yeah they were yeah. like they were the performing hard driving rhythm and blues blues really cool all, all that early stuff that full house live album is just Stomping. incredible to the to yeah. this day that's the the pre I, that's the pre mtv j guy right right yeah <laughs> pre they were, six. Man, they were a hard they were a hard driving you know they were they, they were a force to be reckoned with yeah they they could keep up with anybody yeah at that point in time and uh you know but you know they got smart and wrote some hits and made a lot of money yeah um, and then retired <laughs> yeah, at least at least peter did anyway yeah. but um that band through that band i met uh i had started you know i i'd become a regular at the sugar shack by by that point i actually started going there when i was 16 all right and uh they didn't have pictures on driver's licenses back then right so our old singer from e pluribus unum greg greg patterson who i'm still friends with would loan me his driver's license because we had kind of it was close enough description okay. on the driver's license that that, yeah. that it would pass so i i would start going there and seeing some pretty darn cool bands yeah and uh so you had a colorful going there. Teenage, your, your teenage years were colorful Oh, Vera, and, I, and I've left out, you, you don't want to know how much stuff I've left out, <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> running away from home at 14 and hitchhiking to, to California with right. a girl. Uh -huh. um, it, you know, there's, there are many, many, many stories. There's a, there's a movie's worth of stories Yeah. in, in my young life. It'll be part two, but that's, yeah. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So I, I told you, I did an interview with my friend, Andy Harrison, not too long ago. And, you know, we were there for almost four hours and got halfway through. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. it's kind of nuts. Yeah. But uh, I'm giving you, I'm giving I'm You're the giving abridged you, version, uh, the reader's digest version, right, here. Right. Cliff's notes. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so I started going to the Sugar Shack and there was a particular band that was playing there a lot called, a lot called Sky King. And it was member Bob Hill, the guitar player for that band, had mm -hmm. and the bass player Eric Moore had been in a band 
in Columbus called the Capital City Rockets, were, which were, they were probably the first Columbus band to get a national record deal. Uh, they did an album on, uh, on Electra Records, and it's still available. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, you can find it. Uh, they had a, hit, a semi-hit song called Breakfast in Bed is What I Need. And the singer from that band was a guy named Jamie Lyons, who was the singer in the Music Explosion, who did Little Bit of Soul. Okay, he's the singer on Little Bit of Soul. So that band broke up, and Sky King formed, and they had a girl singer, and uh, Glenn Cadline was playing drums, Bob Hill, Eric Moore, and uh, so how did you meet Eric Moore? Huh? How did you meet Eric Moore? That through that band. Okay. Um, I would go see them all the time. And then they, you know, I worked at the cool music store in Columbus. So they would come down to the, to the music store now and then. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of, that's kind of how I, how I met them. And I would go see Sky King every night they played. They were, I mean, they played most, mostly commercial music, but not a hundred percent, but they were really, really good. Okay. They were making tons of money, drawing great crowds. But Eric had this idea to put together his own band. Eric is, Eric was, uh, he just kind of, you know, he, he kind of one of those guys that danced to his own drummer and always had, you you know, what you saw is never really what you got. You know, he always had, uh, uh, he, he always had some kind of a ulterior motive. Okay. Um, that that's just, just the way he was. And, uh, so he had been thinking about putting together this, this band that he had a concept of. And uh, so he and Glenn, they, they had heard me play guitar down there several times at Lunzar's. Yeah. So he and Glenn up and left Sky King to, to start a new project. And uh, it was going to be called The Gods. Yeah. Eric had the, you know, he had the, the, the concept for all white equipment, and, mm-hmm. you know, he wanted to do all white lighting and blah, blah, blah. He had all these, some good concepts, some bad concepts. Yeah. So they came down there and, uh, and asked me if I was interested in, um, in, well, actually they came down there and said, Hey, can we go down and play? We had a basement there and that's where people rehearse had lessons and stuff. Yeah. He goes, can we go down there and, you know, play through some songs with you just for the heck of it? Yeah. I said, sure. So we did that. And they said, well, we're doing this band. You want to come? And uh, I, I said, yes. Yeah. So I worked at Lunzar's for a little bit longer, but then I went home and I quit. I quit my job and I quit. Uh, I quit. I was going to Ohio State at the time. Okay. And I quit college at the, on, the, at the, on the same day. I went home to my parents. I just quit college, I'm quitting my job. I'm going to be in this band called The Gods. That didn't go over very well. Okay, I can imagine. Uh, <laughs> but I had, by working at Lunzars, I had amassed a, a small guitar collection. Uh-huh. Um, because, you know, working at a music store, you could buy stuff cheap coming in there. Mm-hmm. So I sold off, part of my deal with the band was, I sold off some stuff and I put down a deposit and got us a band house. Okay. Um, on, on Summit Street, uh, right above the Ohio State campus. Okay. Uh, it was a double or duplex, whatever you want to call it. So that's where the band was going to live. Mm-hmm. Now, Eric knew these two guys, uh, this band from, uh, uh, from Parkersburg, West Virginia called Kingsley Fink. And uh, they were a good band too. They had a girl singer. Um, and uh, they, they played down there. You know, they played the circuit down there quite a bit really really good band but he had asked the keyboard player mike adams who also played guitar and sang Mm -hmm. and the drummer hayward law if they would like to leave that band and come do this project you know and get rich and famous and you know write originals and blah 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 and they did they left that band and and they moved up to columbus all right do this band with us now everybody lived at the band house except Glenn because Glenn was married and already had an apartment. So he lived, you know, with his wife there. But at that band house, there was anywhere between eight and 20 people living there at any given time. You know, the road crew lived there, you know, girls in and out. You, you know, you're you're starting this band and you already have a road crew. You're already thinking road crew and management and all this. Not management, but road crew. Okay. 
Yeah. Yep. We had uh we had we had a three guy road crew and okay. we hadn't even played a gig yet. That is wonderful. All we did was rehearsed in the basement. Well, Eric, Eric had a way of talking people into things. Man, he had a line of shit a mile long right. until the day he died. Okay. You know, his his and I would get into this later, his 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 biggest he's he's one of the most talented individuals i've ever met in my life yes um he just couldn't quit stepping on his own dick yeah he just man he just he couldn't get out of character okay um, there was know, no started, there was no uh, quiet eric Moore. no he started he started believing it he started believing his own bullshit a little too much okay and that's where the downfall was yeah um but Anyway, so here we are at this band house and we would, every day we would, well, we'd be painting our equipment white. Uh, the, the guys from, uh, the guys from um, Kingsley Fink had a PA. So we, we had a PA. We made these speaker cabinets, these big 215 speaker cabinets that were the worst sounding cabinet I ever heard in my life. But Eric wanted all the gear to look the same. So we had that, we painted that, painted a white B3, um, painted all the drums white, blah, blah, blah. And we would get up and practice at 10 o'clock every morning and practice till about six and then work on gear the rest of the night. While in the meantime, you know, going to the sugar shack after that and drinking and doing quaaludes. Okay. Um, we're big into those. So what years are we talking? This is real early 76. Okay. Uh, it, maybe late 75 but you know i have a little trouble with that i i, I think it was real real early 76 okay um and uh, we had a booking agent we we had a booking agent uh from columbus and we we were a cover band at the beginning mm -hmm. and uh because we knew if we wanted to work in clubs at all we would have to play covers they didn't want to hear about any originals i think yeah. we might have done one original at that time which was a a uh a completely refined version of gotta keep a running okay you know, probably a two and a half three minute version of gotta keep a running okay so that was our first original eric song okay so um we went out and we started playing the bar circuit some in columbus uh we played the sugar shack in columbus the yellow lion uh, the safari east then we go down and play ollie's in parkersburg west virginia mm -hmm. Uh, go up to Kent and play Filthy McNasties. Gosh, some club over in Macomb, Illinois, we'd go play. Okay. And we were playing goofy, goofy stuff. I mean, we were playing some good stuff, some, you know, stones and stuff like that here and there. But I mean, I can remember us doing um, Bad Blood by Neil Sadaka, you know, which was a really big hit song. We did They Do Run Run. Uh, we did, Saturday night, we did Saturday night by the Bay City Rollers. All right. You know, which which now thinking back on that song, that's actually a pretty cool song. That, that's yeah. actually kind of a cool song, like sweet songs are cool songs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but back then it was bubblegum. Yeah. But, but now it's cool. Uh, but, you know, we were doing all that kind of, you know, there are, we had a pretty eclectic song list. At so that so you're, you start, the gods start off as a, a performance idea. We have a certain look, uh, and we started this off with kind of more mostly covers. Yes. Okay, weird covers and stuff you wouldn't expect. Yes. You're not a, you're not a you're not a um a wedding band cover, not that kind of cover. No, no, but th there's actually a video that exists. I don't know if it's online or not of us playing some kind of a showcase at Denison University, mm -hmm. and a bunch of bands played the showcase, and everybody just hated us. I mean, just hated us. We, uh, you know, we were somewhere between, we were like glam bikers. Yeah. yeah. You know, we, we kind of, there, there was no real concept for what we wore at that point. And we were kind of, uh, you know, we were still wearing platform shoes and, and makeup, but leather jackets, you know, okay, yeah. that kind of thing. We were somewhere between David Bowie who didn't exist at that time and yeah. the New York dolls. Okay which which actually caused us to get fired from some clubs get in fights in clubs things okay. like that people just they didn't dig it okay. we got we got fired from a club in in uh in um bowling green ohio before we even played a note because we got in a fight with some of the jocks that were in the bar 
Okay. And uh, so a fist fight ensued and we got fired before we even played. Okay. <laughs> uh, so that's kind of, that's kind of, that's, that's kind of the way that all started. Yeah. Um, then, and once again, that feels like it went a really, really long time, but it didn't, you know, that was probably most of 1976. Okay. So, so you're eventually, you start off with all these covers, but eventually you take a cover out, you put an original in. Yes. Um, to the best of my recollection, you got to keep running was the first song that we did. And then Eric might've brought in go away. I mean, he had a lot of these songs already, mm -hmm. um, or baby, I love you. One of the other songs from the first record mm -hmm. and Glenn had brought in, um, that song guaranteed that's on the first album, Okay, which, uh, which made me want to write now. Before all this happened, I think we'd only been doing "Got to Keep a Running." Before all this happened, uh, Mike and Hayward were killed in a car accident. Okay. So we had played. Uh, Mike, Mike had, and Hayward are the other the other guitar player, keyboard player, and drummer. Okay. The guys from West Virginia. Okay. So we had uh, uh, we had procured some money from a guy in Columbus that used to follow the bandit and in, inherited some money. So we procured, procured some money from him to put together these promo packs for the band. Yeah. Nice, nice color promo packs. Yeah. Um, and we had played at the, we played at the, uh, the Sandpiper, which was our very first gig place, Sandpiper in Springfield, Ohio, okay. which was also a, it was a Sandpiper swim club, but they had a bar in there. People, people used to literally sit in there. Their big thing down there was sniffing glue, Dean and Barry 88. And they'd sit in the club with brown paper bags on their faces, huffing glue in the club. <laughs> I swear to you. Makes so you look like was, a choir boy. Wild, it was a wild place. Yeah. Uh, guys would ride their motorcycle into the club and stuff like that. Yeah. So um, we'd gotten done playing and I was as sick as I've ever been in my life. You know, I was probably running a fever of 104. Uh -huh. um, I had to sit down and play this, the, the second set okay. or the third set or fourth set. I, I don't remember how many we did there, at least three. Yeah. Uh, and I had to sit down and play. Mike and Hayward the next morning were going to go to West Virginia to pick up the promo packs because we had them made down there. They knew somebody in West Virginia to, ha to have them made. Okay. And we also had some blown up speakers and they were going to take them down there and get reconed. And uh, I was actually going to go with them and I was sick and I didn't go. So Hayward decided instead of taking the van, he had this thing called a Bradley GT, which is basically a fiberglass chaparral looking kind of body on a Volkswagen frame. And they were very popular back then. It was Blue Sparkle. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it was cool looking. So they decided to drive that down to uh, Parkersburg. And uh, they were hit head on by a semi. Wow. And uh, melted, literally melted. The car melted. Um, uh, all the money they had of ours was gone. You know, they uh, and, and they died in this car accident. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody knows the exact circumstances of it. Uh, it, though the two weeks later the truck driver committed suicide it's kind of a bizarre thing mm -hmm. so i had gone home i had, i was so sick that i didn't want to stay in the band house i had actually gone home to my parents house because i was that sick and my doctor was still in grove city and uh they called and told me that the you know about the accident mm -hmm. and blah 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 and th then the next thing i know i'm i'm well enough to go back to the band house and eric has asked Bob Hill from the Capital City Rockets and uh, mm -hmm. and and um, uh, the band that, that that he and Eric and Glenn were in together uh, to join the band. Um, so now we have Bob Hill in the band, who is also a very experienced songwriter, guitar player, and singer. Yeah, and he's also way older than the rest of it. He's old. He's thirteen years older than me. Okay, uh, but it's kind of kind of ironic because he's probably the guy that looked the youngest in the band right. yeah um but uh yeah sky king had kind of broken up after you know all those guys left and he wasn't doing anything so he came and joined the band so at that point in time he you know he brought in a couple of originals because he'd been writing for years 
And at that point in time, I decided I should start writing some stuff. Mm -hmm. So the, the first song that I, uh, the first song that I wrote was a song called under the table, which is on the first album. And then I, then I wrote, uh, cross country, which wasn't called that because I didn't have any words. So Glenn and I kind of sat down and wrote the words to that song, which was the second song I ever wrote. That is bizarre. So we started you, you morphing that, those. You huh? know that's rare, right? It's what? You know that's rare. The first so two songs you've ever written make it to an album. <laughs> yeah, and they may still be the two best songs I've ever written. I okay. don't know, 40 years later. Okay. Um, uh, they're, they're certainly the two that have lasted the longest. Mm -hmm. But uh, so we start morphing these songs into the set. So now we're almost half and half and we're not doing any goofy covers at, at this point in time we're doing you know i i can remember doing like a couple of lou reed songs like we did sweet jane okay um uh we did because uh, i sang that song okay. um we actually did uh we did a couple of kiss songs okay i know we did strutter because i sang that song too that's wonderful and, uh, that, that was my uh gateway band <laughs> that was what that was my gateway band Oh yeah, man. I, I saw kiss open for Rory Gallagher and it changed my life. Yeah. You know, I was a fan as I still am to this day. Yeah. Um, but they, uh, uh, we started morphing, um, more originals into the set. Mm -hmm. And that's when Eric really more started becoming the character, Eric more talking to the audience Okay, and you know, the, the, that rap section that's in, um, rap yeah. meaning, talking instead yeah. of the music rap yep. we just called it rap at that point mm -hmm. the, the talking section gotta keep it running was kind of going on in between all the songs okay you know he'd have stories for songs and yeah. you know that's just the way he talked to people yeah i mean it didn't morph into that song for a long time for quite a long time okay so our big song at that we didn't even end with that song the big song we ended with at that point in time was candy's gone bad the golden earring song that ended up on the first album okay but we always ended we always ended with that um so we were still playing the smaller clubs i remember playing like the still going down to ollie's in west virginia and playing the yellow lion and playing the safari east but we started playing the agora on on like a friday or saturday night which was a big place. It's called the Newport Music Hall now. Yeah. It's still on campus in Columbus. Yep. Um, you know, holds legally twelve or fourteen hundred people. Mm -hmm. um, but everybody, I mean, at the, as the Agora, everybody. Like I said, I saw Kiss there open for Rory Gallagher. Yeah, yeah. I saw Queen there, uh, Bad Company there, ACDC there. You know, everybody on their way up used to play that room and still yeah. do. So we started playing there for you know we draw. 30, 40, 50 people that would come see us at the smaller bars. Yeah. And I can't tell you why, but all of a sudden I can remember, I still have some of the posters. I can remember we, we would go down and literally staple, you know, posters of, of us playing, you know, like the next week on the telephone poles down on campus to get people to go there. Yeah. We were starting to get some radio station support because we we'd hired a manager, a guy named Rob Friedheim, who worked for uh, the the uh, it was Ohio State con concerts or something. He worked for the big promotion mm -hmm. thing out of Ohio State that booked all the concerts coming into St. John Arena and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And he knew all the people at the radio station, so the radio station started talking about us a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I mean, to this day, I don't think anybody can can describe to you or, or give you a reason for what happened all of a sudden this band that's drawn 30 or 40 50 100 people all of a sudden you know the next night the next time we play there it's 500 people the next time it's 750 people word of mouth and then it just it just blew up just blew up the small clubs were over um we're so that here is the in Columbus at mm -hmm. the Agora, that which is the only place we would play there, mm -hmm. and it became an event to see. Yeah, the here's what, and I I want to I want to ask you this because one of the things that I have heard was that you you have played all these different towns in Ohio, and you're like planting seeds. 
people are hearing from me all over the place the, as the gods. Mm-hmm. And then eventually that's what you, you guys are like, like for those who don't know Ohio, it's like Buckeye, a Buckeye is a thing that is like patriotism. It's like state pride. You know what I mean? Well, especially, especially in Columbus. I mean, Buckeye. You know, yeah. the Ohio State Buckeyes are an institution here. It is an institution. It is we we take pride in this. We all have Buckeye paraphernalia, but the gods <laughs> are the same way. And I think some of that would could you played everywhere for a, for a while? Yeah. And it's like you would play anywhere, and and you treated every room like it uh like it was uh twenty thousand people. From, from we gave it our all all yeah. the time. Absolutely. Yeah. So we that is a... we, we we in our mind, even as a bar band and, and especially me being, I mean, being very young, I mean, I was 19 years old when I joined that band and uh, 21 when we did the first album. And in fact, I turned 21 in the studio, I think maybe um, I was a rock star at that point in my mind, I was doing exactly what I wanted. You're on do. your path. I was performing in front of people, which was exactly, I had found my way yeah. at, at, at that point. Yeah. Um, uh, other than the, uh, you know, other than the lots of money part, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. we, we were poor though. When we started playing the Agora for all those people, we actually started making pretty good money. I was going to say, um, but we, at, at that point in time, you know, we're, you know, there's, we're setting attendance records in yeah. this room over national bands. We had, you know, who Budgie is. Yeah. Uh, they opened for us. Oh, yeah, I believe this at, at the, probably at the lots of others too. Cause we were, we were so big there. Cheap trick yeah. opened for us. Yes. Um, Cause we were, we, that, that was in Cleveland though, because we, we were just huge in that, in that market. So yeah. the radio station and our manager started having people uh having record companies come in and, and look at the band and a couple came in and passed and uh, we actually got signed uh by millennium by donnie or by jimmy and donnie einer uh from millennium records which was an offshoot of um uh, they were owned by casablanca yes. subsidiary of casablanca and they came to see us then donnie came back and brought don brewer with him because jimmy einer had produced a, a grand funk out jimmy einer's produced everybody okay um then donnie well donnie of course went on to uh, to run run sony and run columbia records and stuff for years and years after millennium but uh they brought don brewer back uh, to see us because they wanted they wanted to use donnie as a producer yeah, at that point, because Grand Funk had broken up, uh -huh. and they had remained friends, and Donnie wanted to be a producer, so they brought him, and we got signed that night. They offered us a record deal that that night on live performance. That band had never ever been in the studio. We never recorded anything. Yeah, ever. It was just and Donnie Donnie Einer told me that that one song in, he knew he was signing the band. Oh yeah. Because of the, I mean, it was like hysteria. It wasn't Beatlemania, but it was still as hysterical yeah. as you can get in the the Agora. That's the stuff that they cannot really. I don't know if they can or not, but the record companies can't can't make that. That is something that you, that it's not right. Exactly. It's exactly. Like, you are you have the stuff they can't make. Right. Right. Pretty much. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And and we're a package. I mean, we're there. We're tight. We're we yep. know what we're doing, and they like our songs. Yeah. Um. So that had to be early, it was cold. So it was early 77 when that happened. Then we ended up going up to, to record the, actually it wasn't my birthday at the studio, but Elvis died while we were in the studio. So that must've been August of 77. Okay. Cause I think Elvis died in August of 77. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we go up to uh, grand funk studio, um, in uh uh in Howell, Michigan, and it's called the Swamp, uh -huh. and uh and go up to record the album. Now, now not only are we doing this, but Grand Funk, that's the band I left out of the band's material that we used to play back when I was in high school bands. And we played a ton of Grand Funk because I still love Grand Funk Railroad. Same here. It's one of my favorite bands of all time. Yeah. Um, but now 
you know, I'm in the studio with a guy that is one of my biggest Idol. heroes. Yeah. You know, I'm I'm hanging out with Don Brewer for God's yeah. sake, and I'm I'm recording through one of Mark Farner's amplifiers and blah 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 blah. So I think we took probably less than two weeks to do that to do the record. Uh, we recorded more songs than made the first album. But the the funny thing about that, that well, two things about that. They the way Donnie recorded and Grand Funk recorded was different the way some other people record. They record all music with no scratch vocal track, and you come back and do the vocal track. Okay. So we did that, and then we had to come back and do the vocal track. And that big talk section in the between, uh, in in uh, Gotta Keep a Running, Eric has to overdub that, not knowing how long it's going to be. And, yeah, yeah. and I mean, and it and it took a while. It's kind of rare. To, Honestly, it's kind of rare to have that overdub section, what that section is in a song. That is something usually somebody will put in the song live. After yeah, it's spontaneous. The yeah. yeah. So he had to make it sound spontaneous, yet figure out exactly where we started and ended different parts in there, because there are parts in there. It's yeah. not just a bunch of crap going on. Well, it is a bunch of crap going on, but it's parts. Yeah. Um, so Organized uh, crap. So he, 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 you know, he, and, and it worked, he did that. It was the same with, uh, it's the same with cross country. I did not record my guitar solo while we were playing the song. Yeah. I had to go back and restructure my guitar solo to fit the middle section of the song. So it was kind of weird, but, but we got it, but we got it done. Um, so we go back down to Columbus and uh, record label calls. And they said, Hey, you guys didn't record candy's gone bad. We went, well, no, that's not our song. You know, that's a golden earring song. They go, oh no, oh no, you're recording that song. So we all jumped in the van, which we had a van at that time as Bob's and with some equipment, with the equipment and drove right back up to Michigan, set up in the studio, played through the song once. And that song is live. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, uh, and what you got is what you got. Mm -hmm. and, but it came out good and it came out very powerful uh that that's one of my favorite songs on the record mm -hmm. but uh so that that song ended up they ended up cutting maybe three of the originals that we had recorded at that point mm -hmm. uh, none of bob's songs made it on the first record and there was another one of glenn's that didn't make it another one of eric's that didn't make it on that record okay um a couple of them ended up on the second album but there was some you know like i said some unreleased material from those sessions i have no idea where it is but it exists somewhere yeah yeah um so basically, uh, then we, uh, we released the album in the early, it was early 78 uh, when that album was released. Um, I don't think they got it out for Christmas. They may have, but I, I mean, I don't remember because yeah. we didn't start our first tour until 78, which was February of 78. Mm -hmm. uh, we went out with, um, that's when we started the tour with Angel okay. in, uh, in St. Louis. Yeah. So how far do you want me to go with this? You want me to finish the gods for you? Well, yeah, yeah, let's let's talk or do you about you want to ask me some questions and yeah. shut me up for a minute. No, no, <laughs> no. Okay, so that first tour, that first tour, um, who all did you open for? It was Angel. Did you open for Kiss at all? There there's one there's one of the big there's uh, here here's one of the uh the gods urban legends that I'm gonna finally tell everybody about. Okay. That is not true in any way, shape, or form. Okay. There's even it's even in print in books that we open for the for a Kiss. Okay. Never, ever. We were never on stage with Kiss ever anywhere. Yeah. The closest we came was Paul Stanley coming to see us, and I I knew it was him because I'd seen those guys without makeup years before that. Yeah, and um, at a at a show in in Columbus at Vets Memorial, I was there at Soundcheck. Yeah. And uh, I saw him without makeup and I knew it was Paul Stanley. He was at the, um, uh, oh gosh, what's the name of that place? I can't think of anything today. Um, in New York City, it was us, Angel, and Judas Priest. Okay. And it was Judas Priest's first live American date ever. And Paul Stanley was there, sans makeup, sitting backstage. Okay. I never talked to him and everything, but I knew it was him sitting there. Yeah. And then... Um, then Ace Fraley being at a party in Long Beach that they had on some big 
ship there that they use for parties. And it was a party for us and Angel. And he was there. And I don't even think I talked to him there, but that's as close as we ever came to doing anything with Kiss. Okay. So I, I, the urban legend is that uh, Gene Simmons once met it was on, on, on the Sunset Strip, Eric Moore, and, and he goes to Eric Moore, he goes, you're the guy that did all the drugs back in the 70s. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That may be, it's probably, it's probably, yeah, it could, yeah it could be. Yeah, yeah, it might, it's probably true. He did do the drugs in the 70s, but. Yeah, but the Gene Simmons <laughs> thing, no. Yeah. Um, but, no, so we never had. He's not the only one to do drugs in the 70s, though, is what I'm saying. Right, exactly. <laughs> and, and, you know. To I, point I, him I, out. The the, the 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 rest of us were doing a pretty good job of it at that point in time too yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you, but there's a lot of there's a lot of god's facade out there that you know that have just morphed into things that they just never were yeah um so no Urban kiss myth. we ended up we were with um uh started off just us an angel then it was us and Angel and Blue Oyster Cult was the headliner. They were, you know, Blue Oyster Cult was an arena band for about two years, I think, when they, you know, when uh, Godzilla was out or whatever, you know, song they had. Yeah, Don't Fear the Reaper. And... Yeah, yeah. So we were playing like arenas with them. Yeah. Um, then there was I, other bands I can remember being on the bill. I remember Head East being on some dates um then we did uh then we did some date we did a date with uh uh rainbow with richie blackmore's rainbow and uh ario speedwagon in new york um there were a bunch of middle acts on the on the uh angel tour and i can't remember i can't mm -hmm. remember most of them yeah um like i said we you know i'd drink i'd drink a bottle of wine a bottle of blue nun before we played then another one after we got done playing okay so i was always three sheets not to mention the you know we were all on quaaludes we had prescriptions for quaaludes so yeah. we had a never-ending supply of those um but we seemed to play okay <laughs> you know, on that later well, yeah you kind of get used to it yeah um but uh the, the so that uh, first tour how how long did that first tour last that tour lasted I'm going to say up till April or well, no, it was lap. It was after that. It was probably May or June and it was supposed to keep going. But um, in Columbus, Georgia, one of Blue Oyster Cult's semis went flying off a bridge over a river there and killed the truck driver. Okay. And, uh, and a bunch of the, you know, whatever equipment was in that rig and that kind of ended the tour right there. Yeah. So we came, we came back and then we just started doing some, uh, uh, I think we, we just started doing some, um, uh, you know, one-offs ourselves. Yeah. I think that's, well, that had to be that it had to be around, it was, it had to be around May or June. Um, cause in June we headlined at music hall in, uh, in Cleveland, and that's when Cheap Trick opened for us. Okay, uh, there was a Casablanca band called Trigger who did one album for them, mm -hmm. and then Cheap Trick, and then the Gods at, okay. at Music Hall up there. And we probably played the Cleveland Agora, maybe the Columbus Agora, something like that. But later that summer is when we went to Bearsville um, in New York album number two to, to do the second album, which we were not prepared for in any way, shape, or form. Okay. Well, you, you, you work all your life to get to album number one. And then, then uh, a year later, we have to work on album number two. And what was right. the story with album number two in a nutshell? In a nutshell, failure. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Bad stuff. First off, we didn't have enough material. Okay. At least not enough good material okay. for it. Um, we'd been writing on the road a little bit. Glenn and I... Uh, Glenn and I actually wrote 714 in a hotel room with me playing a, an electric guitar, not plugged into anything and him beating on a pillow with, with his hands. Okay. And I have a cassette tape of that. All right. Uh, he and I doing that. And he wrote another song during that point called drunks and bums and slobs that never got, never saw the light of day uh -huh. with that band anyway. Yeah. So We'd written a couple of things. I had not written anything on my own at all. What did the songwriting process look like for you? Was it always instantaneous? 
Mm, you mean for me personally or yeah. the band? For you personally? The band never wrote together. Okay. Uh, Glenn and I were the only ones that ever wrote together in that band. Okay. Everybody else wrote on their own. Okay. Um, Eric, I think, would have pieces of things and it would take him a while to put something together. But then yeah. sometimes he'd just sit down and write write the whole thing, bam, done. Yeah. Uh, Bob, I couldn't tell you. You know, I think... Was he, Bob, was he pretty adept at guitar, Eric? Yes, he's a good guitar player. Okay. Yes, was a good guitar player. Yeah. Um, but, and I'm one of those guys, I generally wrote music to my songs first. Yeah. I, I am I am not a lyricist. I, I, I am a terrible lyricist uh -huh. still to this day. Yeah. And so I would always bring music into people. Okay. Though so for the um, the second album, the two songs that I wrote that got on there, I wrote the whole songs. Okay. Um, the "Rock Your Socks Off" I wrote while I was driving the car. Okay. And I was somebody was riding with me, and I said, "Hey, start writing this down." Okay. And I just made up the words, and it sounds like it. They they're the you guys could carry a cassette tape wherever you went. Um in hotel rooms and things, yeah. but, but not so much in the car, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, but in, yeah, we all had, uh, we all had these JVC tape recorders that we carried on the road with us to listen to music, of yeah. course. And, and in case we would write something. Yeah. Um, so we get to the studio in Bearsville, Donnie Brewer is going to produce again. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we go in to, to try to do a, a little little pre-production and figure out what songs we're going to do. And me, meanwhile, we're still kind of writing the songs in the studio. Mm -hmm. uh, the song that I have on the second album called I'll Buy Your Love, which is just a dumb song. I actually wrote it up there in the studio. Okay. And, uh, <clears throat> and that one just kind of came together all at once because yeah. we needed another song. Yeah. So being the way we were, and what we thought we wanted and the way Donnie saw things and the way the record company saw things were on three different planes. Okay. The songs we wanted to put on the record, uh, the record company didn't necessarily want us to put them on the record. Donnie could go either way, but he was getting, he already, you know, gave himself an ulcer doing the first album with us because we weren't easy to, you know, he would have to bribe us to do things. Yes. You know, it's like, you know, I'll buy your favorite bottle of booze, you know, tonight, if, if you guys can get through two basic tracks today, okay. that kind of thing. So uh, he ends up leaving okay. because I can't, I can't do this. You know, we went to, there was a bar in Woodstock called uh, Joyous Lake. And we were, were, were there one evening after we'd just gotten there and he looks at me, he goes, I'm, I'm, I'm quitting. I'm not going to do this because mm -hmm. he and I had become really good friends at that point in between the first two albums i went up to uh uh the swamp and played they did a an album called flint yeah, yeah. which was yeah. everybody from grand funk except mark farner and i went yeah. up and played i went up and played on that album yeah so he and i become good friends and that's where i met craig frost and mm -hmm. uh, i became really good friends with all those guys mm -hmm. so um i said well if you're leaving i'm leaving he goes no no he goes he goes see this out you know, see, see do, do it, you know, do the record, see this out. So they either couldn't find any producers, didn't want to pay any producers, or nobody wanted to do the record. So Eric ended up producing the record with the help of a couple of really good engineers up there. Okay. Um, some of the songs are okay. Uh, we, we, we changed everything about our recording process from the first album to the second album, which was a big mistake. You know, we had some like boogie amps come in you know, that we rented and stuff like that. The first album, Donnie made us set up our stage setup, you know, of course in different rooms with, you know, with, with plexiglass and stuff in front dampeners in front of them. But we basically plugged in and played like we did live. Yeah. Cause that's gear. I want you to use. I want you to sound like that. Second album, we didn't do that. And we tried experimentation with different amps and guitars and blah, blah, blah. So we ended up not sounding anything like that second album didn't sound anything like the first album yeah. at all. I'll bet that I'll be there are some good songs on there that if they were re-recorded would probably be okay. Yeah. But, but the actual production of the album is awful, just awful. It's thin. Eric wanted us to sound like, and in his words, and and he thinks it sounds thought it sounded pretty bad after a while too. He goes, I wanted the band to sound like Sha Na Na. 
So he's, he's a big old rock. Well, you can tell he's a three chord rock, big three chord rock. Mm-hmm. And roll band. Yeah. And, uh, but it was a mistake and the album cover is pretty good, but the, the album sucked and it, and it tanked. Yeah. And uh, we went on a tour to do it. And uh, we went to Texas and I know that tour started in November because we were on a bus Thanksgiving day leaving for, for Texas. Okay. And uh, that, te- that tour was with, uh, with Triumph, who we'd never heard of, who unbeknownst to us at that point had, a, you know, an album called Rock, and, and, Rock and Roll Machines. <laughs> and their album is called Rock and Roll Machine. Yeah. They have white gear. We have white gear. Yeah. Now, the difference between the, our, the, difference between the two bands is our white gear is real. There, there's Rick Emmett's stacks were hollow in the back oh they really just carried him out he played through some yamaha amp that they did on the side okay. but his marshall sacks were hollow in the back okay. so we did a bunch of dates with some head we were supposed to co-headline with them that tour some dates they had headlines some dates we would but we ended up just opening because we wanted to get done early and and get out of there uh-huh. so we opened up the whole tour we did a couple of off dates like in colleen texas there's a, band, a bar there called crazy horse that everybody plays mm-hmm. and we branch off and go do that you know ourselves and we uh, a bunch of those dates were with um mahogany rush was on a bunch of those dates too yeah we didn't really get on too well with the triumph guys um you know well, they, well, they they were they weren't the and i don't know they weren't the party animals no no they weren't and they didn't appreciate us being that way because we would we would do we would play pranks on them on stage Uh you know like have a remote controlled semi go across the stage while they were playing Uh Uh, we'd go by hustler magazines and cut pictures out and and tape them down in front of their mic stands and stuff Uh like that and they they weren't appreciative of that kind of stuff at at all so they didn't they didn't much care for us not to mention they had to follow us Okay. And and I don't think they were too happy about that either, because yeah. both bands, te- you know, if you know rock and roll, you know, Texas is a unique market to everywhere else in the United States. Mm-hmm. You can be huge in Texas and not anywhere else. And the other part of this, you can be huge in Texas and um, completely tour there and nowhere else. Exactly. And yeah. bands do still to yeah. this day. Yeah. So it's like its own country both of those bands were huge in Texas. So we were as big as they were down there. And um, so, you know, we had, we had a really good following down there and they would have to follow us every night and they, they weren't happy about it. So after that tour ended, um, Glenn and Bob quit the band. There were a lot of internal strifes, terrible management we had. Our manager was more fucked up on drugs than we were. Mm-hmm. Um, money missing blah 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 and uh so we we uh glenn and bob quit the band and not seeing any light at the end of the tunnel eric thought that i was going to quit when they quit and i threw a curveball at him and i didn't because unbeknownst to me he'd been negotiating with the record company to do a third god's album because we had actually signed i think a four album deal with but with options mm-hmm. And their plan for him was to go out there and he would just become the gods and use studio musicians that they had out there. And that was all unbeknownst to me. Mm-hmm. So I threw a curveball at him by not quitting. So we hired two guys in Columbus that, that, that I knew, Bob Catapano and Rick Hall, and they became the new gods guys. Okay. So we recorded a, a really terrible demo that we did on a, on a, like a, like a boom box at a at the, at the sugar shack where we used to rehearse and we just recorded these originals mm-hmm. that we had on this boom box and eric and i took them out to california uh, to the casablanca people and the songs were horrible the recording was horrible and this wasn't the plan that they had all along so uh uh so they basically dropped us okay. at that point so we came back and did some did a couple of dates with that band. Eric gets in a uh, gets in a motorcycle accident uh, with a motorcycle that he'd owned for about six hours, and uh, he's going on to an exit ramp at about fifteen miles an hour. Runs off the side of the road and breaks his leg really, really bad. 
So he's in a full leg cast. So we play the rest of these dates with him sitting down with a leg cast on. Mm-hmm. And, and it's already, it's gotten to the point where he's barely coherent all the time anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, so Bob and, uh, uh, and Rick and I go to sound checks and Eric doesn't come to sound checks anymore. I had bought a bass for whatever reason. And the three of us are starting to, we're just jamming at, at sound check and I'm playing bass and we're, Actually, I had a couple of, I had some songs, you know, that I'd written either for the second album or what was going to be the third album. And at that point in time, I got pretty, pretty creative. I started writing some songs, Mm -hmm. not knowing what the future held. So we're rehearsing those songs and uh, not long into that, uh, into that, um, Eric ends up sending us all letters and firing all of us from the gods. All right. Our services were no longer needed. All right. So So, this is the beginning of of Rosie, of of Streetheart. Okay. So Glenn, uh, so Bob and Rick and I um, decide to get their old bass player, a guy named Dennis Craig, who I'd known for a long time. And we form a band called, uh, called Streetheart. We procured a place to rehearse above a, above a club in Columbus. And we would, I was, I was flat broke at that point in time. You know, the gods really hadn't made any money other than being on the road some. Mm -hmm. Um, And what money I did have, I either wasted on booze, drugs, living, guitars, whatever. I was flat broke. So I had to get a job. Yeah. And so I went down, I worked at a place called Long's Bookstore on Ohio State campus. For decades and decades, I had a friend that worked down there and he got me a job. So I'm working this job. And, uh, and those guys are playing in a band, uh, the band that they were in before they came to the gods, they went back to play with them again. It was called Cornerstone. So they would they were playing like six nights a week at this club. Okay. So basically, we would rehearse when they got done playing, we would rehearse all night long from like three in the morning, you know, until I would have to go to work at eight in the morning. Okay. So sometimes I get an hour of sleep, sometimes I would. So that's what became that's what became Streetheart. So New Year's Eve between has to be between 79 and 80, I'm gonna say we debuted at the Sugar Shack. As Streetheart? As Streetheart without a lead singer. Me and Bob Catapano were the lead singers. We played almost all original stuff, probably 90% orig- new original stuff, and no God songs. Um, Cause I was, we were kind of done with that stuff. So we were trying a whole new thing and it, it, you know, it went over just out of respect for us being in the gods at one point, but, but it wasn't great. And neither one of us have any business fronting a band. Uh, you know, we can both sing, but neither yeah. one of us are lead singers. Yes. So we get this guy, uh, our sound man knew of this guy from Washington, DC named Butch Trinkle. That's really his name. Okay. So he he came there and uh, he became the singer in the band. Okay. And we went up to Cleveland and did a demo and uh, tried to send it around and shop it to no avail. Avail. Then then uh, then he then Butch quit, and then Bob and Bob and Rick quit. So it's just me and Dennis. So by that time, though, by that time, we had changed the, the band name to Rosie because a friend of mine, I, I got the name Streetheart out of a, one of those uh, uh, oh, record, uh, record album buying guides, price guides. Okay. You know, I used to look through it because I used to collect records. Yeah. And there was a Bobby Darren album called Streetheart. Okay. And I always thought that was just the coolest name. Okay. But a friend of mine lives in Indianapolis called and said, hey, you know, there's a band called Streetheart out of Canada. Okay. I went, no, I didn't know that. And it was, uh, of all people, it was Paul Dean's band, the guy from Loverboy. Okay. Um, so we changed the name. Rick Hall, our drummer, actually came up with the name Rosie, which we always had this joke about Rosie Palmer and her five sisters. And that's where the name came from. <laughs> We're just sitting eating dinner. He goes, how about Rosie? And we went, okay. Yeah. So that became Rosie. So there had been a band from uh, the Atlanta area that came up here and played. They were called Smoke really really good band um they had a guitar player named john level who still lives in nashville or i mean uh, atlanta who's a really really great guitar player 
singer named Carl Sheeler, drummer Bobby Booz, bass player Robert West. Mm -hmm. They were getting fed up with this band because of the way that that John ran the band. They had this band bus that they all traveled in. Uh -huh. And John basically took all the money. And then he was paying those guys $5 a day on the road. That's what they made. They were expected to eat on that, buy drumsticks, you know, strings, whatever, $5 a day. So they were getting fed up with it. But they, I mean... Restature, I mean, they were a good band. Yeah. They were playing cool, progressive, really progressive, you know, really great music. Um, but we knew, I knew that Bobby and Carl, I used to go see them and I knew they were getting fed up with it. Yeah. So Dennis and I decided to call Bobby and Carl and say, hey, you know, Rosie broke up because they were aware of us too, because we were probably the two biggest bands playing around Columbus at the time. Mm -hmm. And they said, sure, you know, let's try this. So they came to Columbus and uh, we rehearsed a couple of times and bam, done. That was that, the, that uh, became that was Rosie, down. but with Dennis Craig on bass. Okay. Um, we end up playing a lot and that band starts getting super popular, you yeah. know, in, in the bar scene around here. We're playing all the bigger bars. We're drawing great crowds here. The Al Rosa Villa, which started out as a really small bar, mm -hmm. the front bar. Um, I mean, they couldn't get enough people in there, you know, to see us. So, and that's what spurred Rick. There's some story about Eric Moore saying, telling him to build the back of that building. And it's another, another urban legend. Yeah. It's not true. The gods had never even played there. Okay. Ever until way later on, till yeah. the big building was already built way later on. So Rosie and a, and a band called the Muffs who changed their name to Money. If you hear either yeah. his name, Suzanne. John We're Durson, both drawing yeah. great crowds there. So Rick, Rick, Rick decided too, to build yeah. on the back of the club. Mm -hmm. So um, we end up being in this, we played at the, we played at the Agora. It might've been the Newport by then on a, uh, I don't know, Wednesday night or something. They used to have live bands on Wednesdays. Actually, a lot of stuff went on on Wednesdays. We used to play the, this huge place called the Dick, Dixie Electric on the West side on Wednesday nights and put 2000 people in there on a Wednesday night when, when people still went out. Yeah. Um, so we were playing the Agora on a Wednesday and there was some huge battle, some big battle of the bands happening the next night that, that we didn't want any part of. Um, we never signed up for it. Didn't want to do it. And they go, they saw us there and they said, Hey, you, uh, um, we need one more band for this battle of the bands. Your gear is already set up. Why don't you do it? So, we said, okay. And in the back of our minds, we already knew we were going to win because, you know, we were just the thing in Columbus at that point. Oh, yeah. So, so yeah, we won. And it, it ends up, this is a big national company. Uh, mm -hmm. They own Del Monte and a bunch of stuff. And it's some big tobacco company. I can't remember which one it is that put these things on. So we go down to Florida to uh, Daytona beach and it's a three-day thing with, with 50 bands from every state around the United States. We're one of the first bands on the first days. Mm -hmm. And we're thinking, you know, great, we're going to go play. By the third day, everybody's going to forget about us. And we went and saw some other bands. There were some really, really good bands that played. But uh, long story short, we end up winning the damn thing. Mm -hmm. So we win this national battle of the bands. And we end up, we met a booking agent down there. So we end up staying in Florida and playing the bar circuit down there for a while. Um, you know, like the, the button and, you know, whatever all these places were down there, mm -hmm. six night a week gigs where you're yeah. playing three, four sets a night. And uh, so we stay down there for a while. In the meantime, the new Al Rosa opens and we can't be there for the grand opening. <laughs> so, so McGuffey Lane did it. And it's the only time they ever played the Al Rosa there because okay. they were not an Al Rosa band it was yeah. that was completely different crowd yeah so um uh when we got back um we we had become kind of disillusioned with Dennis Craig and uh they the Bobby and Carl really wanted Robert West to join the band from, okay. the guy from from smoking okay so we kind of let Dennis go after all of that and uh and brought in Robert and about that time as our, our manager at the time, we were part of the winnings of the winning the Battle of Bands was 
to record a single when people still did that. So we were going to record a single. And somehow he talked them into fronting a whole EP for us. So not only that, we went down and, and recorded in, in Atlanta at Web4 Studios. Mm -hmm. And that became the Rosie EP uh, that we released. And in those sessions, we also recorded a song called Sorry I Forgot Your Name, mm -hmm. which um, ended up on the Precious Metal album. Yeah. Uh, the Rosie Precious Metal album. But it's also on the, uh, it's the first track on the QFM radio hometown album, which they used to do every year. Yeah. They called us and said, hey, you guys need to uh, you guys need to record a song for the hometown album. Just send us something. It's the opening spot on the record. Just do it. Mm -hmm. So we did. And 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 uh, and that was that. And we're actually starting to get, you know, a lot of uh, push from the radio station because we're we're drawing yeah. people, a yeah. lot of people. And that's good for them, too. Mm -hmm. So uh, we record the we record the EP. And um, just come back and we start, you know, we just keep doing, kind of doing, kind of doing what we're doing. You know, we, we're doing stuff that local bands shouldn't be doing, um, like an in-store at Peaches, you okay. know, with a line outside the door to get in to see a bunch of guys that are from Columbus. Yeah. yeah. Um, we did the, had to be between 80 and 81 or 81 and 82, I don't remember, Um we did a live simulcast New Year's Eve from the Al Rosa on QFM. They shut off all programming to do a live simulcast with a local band. Okay. Which is unheard of. Was that, that your first time at Al Rosa? No, we've been playing Al Rosa lots. Even, even the, uh, the smaller Al Rosa? Um, did yeah, you ever... no, we had played the smaller Al Rosa, yes. Okay. okay. Um, and, and then no, and we'd been playing the bigger one, but we'd play there, you know, we'd play like usually Thursday, Friday and Saturday there, or Friday, Saturday, Sunday, mm -hmm. and do capacity every night in there. And, uh, I mean, and then whenever we played on, however many nights we wanted to play. Yeah. And they expand on it and you were still selling out. Yes. And not to mention playing other places in Columbus. We, we would play, um, the Screamin' Willies had this big bar on the east side and one on the north end. We'd play both of those mm -hmm. and still sell it out. The, the place I told you about over on the west side, um, Dixie Electric, yeah. we would sell it out. Um, people just went out then yeah. and, and loved that band. So we end up, uh, we end up getting a, uh, an offer uh, from a local record company to do an album. And that's what became Precious Metal. We recorded that in Columbus. Yeah. And that one of the songs on there that, that I, that I uh, uh, it's one of my songs called uh, Too Much Too Soon. That song actually ended up, it's another, another thing where, you know, before the big corporations took over all the, all the radio stations, you know, they would play local stuff. That song was on rotation at QFM for over a year. Uh -huh. And it was on heavy rotation even for a while and it's a local thing you know and they just don't qfm around here you know hats off to them they're starting to do that again they're getting they just didn't do another hometown well, that, album that, and that seems to be the thing that the columbus music scene has and always i don't know always had going for it but all the pieces were work together yes okay. you know cleveland what, what builds a scene some of the questions Cleveland that I like that too. Yeah. Um, Cleveland with WMMS. Mm -hmm. They, they also had that with kid Leo up there who yeah. was, who was super responsible for breaking the gods. Yeah. Um, but the same thing, yeah. you know, they, they would do their, you can't do it without that support, that synergy. Yes. They, they would do, and Rosie even played a couple of these. So did the gods. They would do their, they would do a, either a breakfast show or a lunchtime show live from the Cleveland Agora up there live on WMMS. And, and, and that helps everybody up there. It helps the radio station, it helps the clubs, it helps the bands, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of that one hand washes the other thing. Yeah. But, but when, you know, and, and I'm not, I'm not trying to, you know, be Joe hippie or something, but when the corporations come in and take over this stuff, it's all about advertising dollars and that's all yeah. they care about, which they need to care about. But then the pre-programming comes in. 
here, here are your 30 songs, you know, that are on rotation. Yeah. That's why QFM just got a new music director there, a program director there. And he's going completely, uh, when I was down there doing an, uh, on the radio uh, in November with, um, uh, with, with Carl Sheeler, we were uh, promoing the, uh, the Rosie reunion show during Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, we were, we were on the air with Archie and they do this thing at five o'clock where they were, you know, hell, they played fast way for God's sake, you know, my going, first concert. Yeah. I said, and, and I said, now that's the way radio is supposed to be. Yeah. And they're doing all these big local promos now and did another hometown album. And they're trying to get it back to the way, because everybody is suffering. Yeah, you know, radio is suffering. They can't get advertisers like they used to. You know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Sirius and and all that stuff like that has taken a lot of that stuff away from them. Yeah. And and so the next the, the 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 obvious solution is try to go back to the way it used to be when it worked. You know, local people see local bands, they listen to local radio. You know, and and that's what you're trying to get. So and, and, yeah, and so the local you, bands you go see the local bands because big name bands were once local bands, right? Exactly. And it's your building. It's like that. Yeah, exactly. And and they're and now you're supporting the local bands, so their fans are now supporting your radio station, which mm-hmm. means they're going to support your advertisers and blah blah blah. I mean, you you need the local people. I hate to say that, and and Columbus as you were saying when I so rudely interrupted you about Cleveland, sorry about that. Um, Columbus, people around here bitch about the music scene. Uh, You know, and a lot of the people that do have not been other places. I have, I've been to a lot of other places. And so have you. Yeah. I mean, the music scene, local music scene in most other places, including major cities is non-existent. Mm -hmm which that's one of the reasons I never, I never picked up when I was living in Las Vegas for 24 years, I never played in local bands there. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it's because he, even if you're in a local band there, you're lucky to play out once or twice a month. Lucky. Yeah. You know, and even then, you know, you're going to get an hour somewhere and nobody really cares here. It's not what it used to be. You can't play in one band and make a living. Well, like we all used to do, mm-hmm. but you can go out and see local live music here pretty much seven nights a week. Yeah. There are less places to play than there ever have been, but there's still more places to play here than there are in most other places. Yes. We have it pretty but darn it, good. There's also, there may or may not be a rebuilding time. I'm, I'm thinking, I mean, well, I mean, we have several, there's a new venue um, that just opened up in Marysville, which is not too, you know, it's, 30 minutes up the road mm-hmm. um it, it's a big venue qfm this friday or this thursday they're doing they they do they have a house band every year that plays a lot of their events you know like the ohio state tailgate parties and mm-hmm. stuff like that uh the final four bands are, are doing that this thursday the king, king of clubs where we did the rosy thing yes he's bringing in all kinds of mid mid line national acts well the, in, the, into the people there. he's bringing in are like somebody my age they're not mid, they're not midline. They're the guys that we used to see back in the day. Well, exactly. Well, they're and I don't mean to yeah. say this the way it's going to sound. It's one of those places you play on the on your way up. Oh yeah. And it's one of those places you play on, on your way, way back. back then, yes. You know, and and that's ha- that happens to all, you know happens to all of us. Yeah. Um, that's not to say that the bands still aren't great, yeah. but the fact of the matter is, people my age and I, I don't know how, how how old you are. I imagine 50. you're quite a bit younger than me. Fifty three. Okay, I'm 65. Yeah. But the people in our age group are still the people that are going out to see the bands. When we did the Rosie reunion shows there, I there are so many, I mean, the place is packed and I know most of those people. You know, I'm seeing the same faces yeah. out there. They're, you know, still standing there spending a lot of money drinking, mm-hmm. having fun, knowing the words to the songs. They're still the people that support live music and they still do. So I'm hoping, you know, with the resurgence of, of some new clubs open, I mean, somebody had to take the place of the Al Rosa anyway, yeah. which the King of Clubs did. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping, and, and that's one of the reasons I moved back here because I want to play live music here again. Yes. How did, how did you meet Bob Seeger? How did that all thing happen? That happened, um, 
I got a phone call in uh, December of 1982 from Don Brewer. And uh, Bob in, in early 82, Dave Teagarden, his longtime drummer quit. He left the band and Drew Abbott left the band also. I don't know the circumstances. He just wasn't there anymore. His longtime guitar player. Mm -hmm. Craig Frost, after the Flint thing didn't happen, um, they had fired Robin Robbins from the Seeger band or whatever. I, once again, I don't know. Um, and uh, Craig went to audition for the Seeger band because somebody told Bob that he could play great B3, which he can. So mm -hmm. he went in and got the job. So sure. after Teagard left, Craig goes to Bob, goes, well, why don't you, you know, call Don Brewer? He's not doing anything. Another Michigan guy, blah, 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 you know. So, excuse me. So they called Don, then they start auditioning guitar players. And they auditioned lots of guitar players. Craig, who I had met through the Flint sessions, and Don, who I had already known, mm -hmm. and then played on their record, both suggested me for an audition. Yeah. So Don called and said, hey, how would you like to come up and audition for Bob Seeger? Now, right at this time, we were shopping uh, the, our manager was shopping the Rosie stuff and Electra records was actually very interested in that band. And uh, Roy Thomas Baker, we had heard was actually inter inter interested in producing us as was Michael Wagner. I don't know for a fact, we just were told that. Yeah. But here I have a chance now to go up and, you know, play with a band that's already national and blah, 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 blah. So I went to the audition, um, got hired that audition came back, told the Rosie guys that I was going to go play with Bob Seeger, but it wasn't going to happen for a while. So we still played, you know, we had some, we had, uh, we had some dates that, that we were obligated to play. So we played those knowing I was going to leave. Then um, I get a call from the Seeger people saying, well, we had to audition two more people. And there was one guy that, that we really liked. His name's Dwayne Bailey he played really good. And how would you feel about coming up and playing rhythm? instead of lead. I said, I'm good with that. You know, I love playing rhythm. I'm a much better rhythm guitar player than lead guitar player anyway, to this day. Um, so I go up and uh, bam, done. You know, we start into rehearsals. Then I get a call from Bob uh, about a weekend. He goes, you know, because I basically took Bob's job as rhythm guitar player, because Bob always played a lot of guitar on stage. He was the rhythm guitar player mm -hmm. and actually played some solos like her strut, stuff like that. That was him. Okay. So he goes, man, I really miss playing guitar. You know, I'm sorry, but I think we're going to go back to, you know, me playing guitar. So I get sent back to Columbus with my tail between my legs. I have to call, you know, I have to talk to my band and go, Hey, <laughs> can I come back? They all, they're all hating me at this point, but we could go out and make some money and play some dates. So I go back and I rejoin Rosie for a couple of weeks and uh, I might've been closer to a month. I don't remember. And then I'm sitting at home one night and I get a call from, uh, from Bill Blackwell, Bob's road manager or tour manager still to this day says, um, can you be on a flight to Roanoke? Virginia tomorrow morning and I went oh boy so they want me back so I uh and and it's all because of one song the hit from the, the the hit song from the album The Distance was a song called Shame on the Moon which is a country song written by Rodney Crowell mm -hmm. and it became a big crossover hit off that record uh, on the country charts and the rock charts yeah um even before um uh Oh, right. Roll me away became a hit. So no one could play that song right except for me. And Bob couldn't play it. No one could play it. And again, they go, we got to play this song and Chatfield can play that song. Mm -hmm. So they call me and uh, and I go to Roanoke the next day and I rejoin the band at that point and leave my band Rosie yet again. So that's basically how that happened. <laughs> They're pissed at you. Did they understand in any way? Or are they just pissed? Pissed. Okay. <laughs> other than Ed, Ed Means, the other guitar player, and Rosie at the time lived with me. Yeah. And uh, me and my girlfriend Judy, and he was understanding. Yeah. About it, and and he actually opportunity. 
and and he watched you know we'd get done with the rosy with rosy gigs when i knew i was going to be called when i knew i was going up the, for the audition i had about a week uh-huh. um and they weren't talking about songs but craig frost would call me every day and go here's the songs we went through today with the other guys that are auditioning mm-hmm. so i kind of had a, a little handle on it yeah so i learned all those songs but the thing that got me the job was was a getting along with everybody i mean i already knew brewer i already the hang, knew Ross. The hang effect i got along famously with chris campbell the bass player the minute we the minute we shook hands mm-hmm. Uh, the sax player alto not so much he and I never I mean we were always okay but I you know I'm I'm an energetic guy and he was always the stage show in that band and when I came in I kind of stepped on his toes a little bit plus I was on his side of the stage okay so he was always bitching about me taking up too much room and being too loud okay but that uh you know that's you know that that's uh that's water under the bridge now yeah but Ed, Ed watched me come back from Rosie gigs, three sheets to the wind, you know, a bottle, a whole bottle of vodka in me, not to mention however much cocaine I'd done that night, mm-hmm. pull out those records and work on those songs for the rest of the night. And, uh, and I worked really hard to, mm-hmm. to do it. And um, so he was very appreciative of it and he was okay about it. Okay. So, but the rest of them, not too happy. Yeah. So. Yeah. That, that was so- pretty much, that was Pretty much so, that for most of part of well the the, the lion's share of 1983. 83. And then you would re- on and off for the next how many years? Like Yeah, well, at the present. end of that tour, um, our opening act for the first part of the tour was uh, John Hall, the guy from uh, Orleans that wrote You're Still the One and all, yeah. you know, some other songs. Then the second half of the tour was Michael, Ver- Michael Bolton, the rock guy. Mm-hmm. So uh, he had just, the, the Michael Bolton album had just come out. Game. And so he was out with us. And that was uh, him, uh, Bobby Torello, Bobby T. Torello on drums, Dennis St. James on bass, Rick Zito on guitar, Richie, Rich Zito on guitar, and Bruce Kulick on guitar. Okay. So, and I played rhythm with Seeger, though. I would warm up in the dressing rooms, in, in, in the little tuning room, you know, and I'd play lead guitar and play with my stuff so they'd heard me play and stuff Mm -hmm. so when our tour ended rick was leaving the band to go tour with um grace slick and they needed a guitar player so michael called me and said hey do you want to come back out with us so i came home for like one day and then went out and and finished the year with uh with michael bolton with uh with bruce kulik and i on guitars yeah how was bruce with how how he and i met how was he was he cool He's great. We're still we're still best of friends. Yeah, yeah he's he's like the coolest dude because I and, and I'm a Kiss fan. A, I'm he's a been Kiss a Grand fan. Funk for like 22 years. Yeah, yeah, right. And uh, he just he moved to Vegas a couple of years ago. Yeah. So and we've we've always stayed in touch. We've always yeah. were great friends. Yeah, yeah, so, that's wonderful to this day. So I know I know through the whole your whole story, the drugs and alcohol have been a a thing that uh, you eventually over- overcame. We got to the point that that was a uh, that you overcame it. How was that? When? How did that affect your music making process? Um, I've been sober nineteen and a half years now, and it's still odd because in not just in music, in all aspects of my life. Okay. Because I spent from the time, I mean, were there periods in there when I would quit for a little bit or something? Yeah. Yeah, there were. And there were a couple of times prior to getting sober now that I, I stayed sober for a year once. You know, I tried to stay sober, did, did the program, blah, 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 blah. Um, but, you know, I would go maybe a month without using for a while. Mm-hmm. But my life was basically whatever form of alcohol I was into at the time. Um, vodka eventually won one over because I just loved vodka, and I was w- when I w- when I quit, I was I was into the the better part of a half gallon a night instead of like a fifth. Okay. Um, and and uh, different drugs of choice over the years, but ended up being cocaine. Okay. For, for many 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 years. Yeah. So I was always. I I'm a functioning alcoholic. Okay. 
I can do my playing job. I owned, you know, my vintage guitar store for a long time. Which we'll talk about. Now, did, did I always make the right, you know, great decisions? No, I did not. Yeah. But could I function? Yes, I could. Okay. And I, uh, um, still playing to this day is a little, it, it, it's very weird because you hear things differently. That's what I was going to say. It's like, it's got to be, that's got to be a shift. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I still, you know, the good thing is I still enjoy playing enough and I can absolutely do it um, with, without the aid of, of drugs and alcohol. I, I basically have a huge inferiority complex. I always have. I probably always will. And that was my, that was probably my reason for the drinking and drugging. Yeah. Um, because it allowed me to be someone that I couldn't be you know, when I was sober, superhero, I've gotten, I've gotten past that to a certain point, mm -hmm. but I, but I still have a big inferiority complex and I still tend to like to sabotage things. I sab I like to sabotage my life because I don't think I deserve something. You know, it's not me sitting there sitting in my head going, Hey, you don't deserve this. It's just a feeling that I have, or that I'm not good enough for it, or people aren't going to accept me for this and that. Mm -hmm. And, and the drugs and alcohol, it allows you to do that to a certain point, but then, you know, when the cocaine really starts kicking in and stuff, it brings you right back to that point. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you get in real introverted and paranoid and things. Um, I have not, I don't think that I've written a good song since I've been sober. Okay. That's the thing that kicks my ass the most. Mm -hmm. And I, I've written a few, nothing, nothing that, that, that I've ever played with anybody, but on my phone now, I used to keep a recorder around, but on my phone, I probably have 200 some odd ditties of things that I'll be playing, sitting on the couch and I'll just, you know, hit the memo button on my phone and record licks, chord progressions that now that, I mean, part of it is, you know, I wasn't really playing with anybody when I wasn't touring. So I really didn't have any motivation much to do that. And I'm starting to play with people around here again. Wonderful. And the motivation is there. And I'm going to have another songwriter friend of mine sit down with me and, and go through some of these things and go, hey, yeah, this might be something this might not. But I'm it's taken me a long time. I'm not sure that Seeger will ever tour again. Nobody's sure. Yeah. Um, but I need to get, you know, keep on. I'm, I'm 65 years old. I don't have forever, but I still yeah. have some time. Yes. And, and, uh, you know, I, in, in the, whatever new project I, I, I get involved with here, new or new old project I get involved with here, you know, I plan on hopefully writing some songs and hopefully writing some good sober songs, mm -hmm. not so much about sobriety, just being able to do yeah. it sober. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, and I've read stories where uh, of other people, you know, you, you, you got to think back that, you know, some of the best songs in history were written under the influence of various drugs and alcohol of you course know, all led zeppelin songs most of the beatles songs Jimi you hendrix. Know? uh you know you can bring Jimi all hendrix the celebrated so purple haze it's, it's not yeah it's not necessarily a real bad thing it definitely it definitely but it at, a, at a certain level point of inhibition yeah but know? at a certain point it takes over it, 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 yes, it go, it will, it will tilt the other direction. Yes. Absolutely. Positively. I just woke up one day, you know, and I've lost countless, countless money, countless relationships, um, over, over the drinking, you know, and, and drugging stuff. Um, and one day in Las Vegas, I just, and I was actually ending a marriage at the time, but it had nothing really to do with that. It just, the marriage didn't work. We parted as friends. Yeah. We actually used the same attorney for the divorce. Okay. So, but I knew it had to stop. Yeah. You know, in all that time from 14 to 44, never, I got pulled over a couple of times, but I never got arrested for a DUI. Mm -hmm. I never got in an accident. I never hurt anybody else. That's and a I blessing. figure at, at this point in time, I've gotten away with that for so long. Yeah, your, your karma. Your karma yeah, has anything to, that's going to happen to me is going to be a biblical proportion. Yeah. You know, if I kill myself, that's one thing. That's my own fault. But the thought of, of killing or hurting someone else, mm -hmm. you know, when you're behind that 3000 pound assault vehicle that you have no visit business driving, you know, I was, you know, I would, 
I joke that, you know, I would have to drive with one eye closed just to see double. <laughs> and uh, that'll be in a song someday. Yeah, um, it should be. It's but a... um, it should be in a country song. Yeah. But, uh, uh, you know, it, I, I, just, I just decided enough was enough. And I stopped. Yeah. I, I drank my last full glass of vodka at a bar called Favorites and that I used to uh, frequent in, in Las Vegas where I'd sit and play video poker and drink full glasses of vodka all night long. Okay. And uh, I drank my last full glass of vodka, closed one eye, drove home and never turned back and stopped. That's wonderful. And You're still here. It. So I couldn't have, yeah, I can't, that couldn't have lasted forever. You're still here. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah, you can't, you know, you, you can't dance with the devil forever. <laughs> so Cowtown Guitars. Yeah. See that well, briefly, uh, briefly, how I started hearing about you was, okay, obviously you were from the gods and, and everybody, and that has set the stage for us, so many other bands, but Cowtown Guitars was like a institution within Ohio before it moved to Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. So how did that, how did that start? Um, I have bought and sold and traded guitars since I was about 16 years old. I could never hold on to one guitar. I'd always be trading something and, you mm -hmm. know, blah, 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 blah. And I told you earlier about my infatuation with equipment. Yeah. I mean, I just, love guitars and amplifiers and everything that goes with them i don't know why i just it's just mm -hmm. just me it's like some yeah. guys like shotguns or whatever yeah. you know i or golf clubs you know i have it with guitars um again one of my after the uh seeger thing and various incarnations of rosie and the gods you know i found myself with 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 no money yeah again so i started working um, at a music store in Columbus called Columbus Music Center, which was an offshoot of Akron Music Center out of Akron. So, you know, I was playing bands. I was playing in various versions of Rosie at that point and various versions of the gods at, at that point during the Columbus music years. Mm -hmm. But those were, I mean, that was some serious, heavy drug, drug and alcohol time, seriously heavy. Mm -hmm. um, I even moved to Los Angeles for a short period of time with the gods at that point, Eric, uh, Eric, myself, um, Kevin Valentine, who already lived there in Jojo weekend, we moved to Los Angeles actually to try to get a record deal. It was right after Freddie was at Freddie Salem was in the band for a while. And, and, and he had left and we replaced him with Jojo. And we were out there playing showcases at Gazzari's and stuff, trying to get a record deal, uh, played Gazzari's, the country club, you know, all the usual ha whiskey, the usual haunts out there. Um, and, uh, you know, we, that's when you either look like poison or you, or you look like guns and roses, you know, that was, that was that era. Yeah. And, uh, we didn't really look like either of them or maybe, uh, maybe an old version of guns and roses. Right. So, you know, it was a young man's game yeah. out there at that point. Not that we were ancient, but we were way older than them. Yeah. And, uh, so that that we you know didn't get a record deal so i uh i i'd had i'd kept the job there so i had insurance and um so after one of the jaunts out there i came back and uh the columbus music thing just wasn't happening the store wasn't happening and stuff and i knew a guy that owned a bar and said hey give me ten thousand dollars and i'll turn it into twenty thousand dollars and he goes, okay. So I did. And I was just going to do it as a hobby with his, with his backing. Mm -hmm. And then I went, you know, I, I started thinking about it and going, you know, this would be a lot better if we had a store. I wouldn't have to go all over the place looking for stuff. And yeah. So I ended up opening up Cowtown Guitars mm -hmm. um, and uh, keeping it in, uh, keeping it in Columbus um once again still playing in various versions of the gods at that point yeah. and i kept it in columbus until um i got called the seeger people called me to go back out on tour in 1996 so um uh i went out and did i did the 96 tour with them came back had met somebody in las vegas 
and decided to move the store to Las Vegas okay. and move to Las Vegas, relocate there. That's the I, real short version of that. Yeah, yeah. So I, the real, um, from those who I have, I've interviewed, that's where they got to meet the real you. When I say that, you've done really cool things, like been supportive of your local scene when uh, a lot of people, in other, in other words, nobody said a bad thing about you, which is kind of rare. <laughs> especially in the, you know, especially. That's what you're in, telling me is. Well, once, like, once again, people knew me drunk yeah. and, 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 you know, and geeked up. And, and that was me. That was the, that was a happy me, yeah. you know, I, and, and, but we were all that way. I was going to say, you know, I, we I, were, I know that I, we're... I'm a, not everybody, but 90% of the people we hung with and we all hung together. It was a big, you know, it was an, all musicians, mm -hmm. you know, we'd all congregate at the same places. We all congregate at Chi Chi's or, or, um, uh, that place that was up at the continent that we used to all go to, um, Slapsy Maxie's, okay. you know, Tuesday night at Slapsy Maxie's, you couldn't, you can't walk in the place and everybody's drunk as hell and, and all coked up and mm -hmm. just having a good old time. That's just the way we were back then. And, and I never, you know, I'm not everybody's favorite person, believe me. Yeah. Um, and, and even with the store, there are people that I did not get along with. There's still people in this business I don't get along with, and I'm sure they feel the same way about me. You can't, you can't love everybody and everybody can't yeah. love you. Yeah. And, um, but you know, I've, I've always tried to stay a, a, a above board, you know, with, yeah. most, with most everything. And well, you would, you would get equipment for people who um they lost all their equipment and you make it possible for them to keep keep their dream alive well I, I, yeah and, and, and these and kinds of things try to do I'm that over somebody, and over again if somebody needs something yeah. yeah yeah i mean it's funny ed means sums it up pretty well because i've been known to be hard to get along with in a band situation and Sometimes I'm, I'm wrong, but sometimes I'm one of those guys that, that, you know, if we're practicing, you come in prepared, you know, you practice, well, you practice at home, you rehearse with the band, you know, you come in, you don't learn your songs, you know, don't be learning your songs on our time, learn yeah. them at home, come in, know them, let's do it. So, you know, when people are pulling their weight or whatever, yeah, I can be a real dick, but <laughs> And, and Ed's told me many times he's had to, you know, well, I've heard Chatfield is this or Chatfield is that. He goes, he goes, you know, the guy just likes something, some, he just likes everything right. But man, if you need something, he'll give you the farm. Yeah. And, uh, and that's just, you know, people have been that way with me. Mm -hmm. People have shot me, people have given me a lot of slack over the years, given me opportunities that, that I may or may not should have, should have, should have had. Mm -hmm. And, it's just just the way I am. Yeah. You know, can I can I be a, a selfish prick? Yeah. Ask any of my ex-wives <laughs> or, or my current one for that right, right. For, for, for that matter. Um, you know, we all have our we all have our little dark sides of here, course. you know, but you keep yourself in check. Yeah, exactly. Keep... Exactly. And and as far as I mean, have there been times when I've been in competition with some local people around here music wise? Yeah. Especially early Rosie, mm -hmm. you know, when everybody's vying for the top spot, Yeah, the gods, the gods, not so much. Cause I was young. I didn't care about the other bands. I loved all the other bands around mm -hmm. here, but then when we started getting big and there were bands obviously that could play better than us and things like that, you know, they, they start getting a little snooty. Well, these guys got handed everything. Well, 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 no, we didn't. You know, we we busted our ass as much or more than anybody. I mean, we were this. The, here's a true God story. <laughs> One of the few. I mean, we were broke. You know, if it wasn't for various people coming in and giving us food and money and stuff or whatever, you know, we didn't have a pot to piss in pretty much. Mm -hmm. um, at the end of the week, we would drink so much at the bar, the bar tab would be over what we got paid, yeah, you know, wow. so we'd actually owe money. But we actually on Summit Street, Eric was a pretty avid hunter okay. and, you know, gun guy. We shot city squirrels in the backyard for food and he would skin the squirrels and we would fry them for food. That's, that that's, 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 that's how bad it got at, at certain points. Okay. We, we have, we have paid our dues 
uh, you yeah. know, many, many, many times. I'm still paying them. Yeah. You know, I, I, what are you doing now? I'm sorry. What, what's the future? Ha- what What are you doing now? Um, well, we did the rosy thing. We were talking about doing it again in the summer uh, because it was super successful and we had a really, really good time. Mm-hmm. And yeah. and we never, it's my dog. She gets, uh, she gets upset when I'm talking to somebody too long that's not her. Mm-hmm. Molly, stop. No, 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 no. So anyway, um, we're talking about doing a summer date, which we've never done. We always play during the winter next to a holiday. Uh, it'd be nice to do something when it's warm. Yeah. And I just filled in with a band called Gary Sunshine and the Wonderful Disappointments mm-hmm. for my friend Andy Harrison. He's the regular guitar player. But uh, Gary's an all original guy. We play a couple of covers, but he has a boatload of originals. And it's kind of a cross between Lou Reed and Lucinda Williams. All right. Wonderful. Um, his stuff is really good. And I had a really good time doing it. Mm-hmm. May I do that again? I don't know. He doesn't play out that often. Um, it, we just moved into a new house. So that's been taking up a lot of time, you know, getting things situated and getting You're back in Columbus, back in Columbus. Yes. Um, I start rehearsing next, uh, n- next Thursday night with a project that we started in 2019, right before COVID hit. All right. And, uh, and I, I can't really tell you what it is. Um, I can, uh, but I don't want to say anything in case it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> don't jinx me. We'll do it. We'll do a round two. <laughs> Let, let's just say, let's just say people are going to be familiar with it. Okay. Wonderful. And, and that's all I'm going to say. Yeah. And uh, I do a lot of stuff with, um, there's a drummer here in town named Keith Pickens. Okay. And I first met him when I was doing a little stint with the boys from nowhere here. And then he and I still play on sessions and live sometimes with this guy named Mick Divins, who had the boys from nowhere. And we still, I, I played on his, on his new demo stuff. And I've done some live, a couple of live dates when I was still living in Las Vegas, I'd fly mm-hmm. and play live with him. Yeah. And uh, so I've work, been working on a project with, with, uh, with Keith. Mm-hmm. and we'll we'll see after next thursday you know how this is going to go and then then i'll call you and tell you all right wonderful <laughs> thank you mark thank you mark uh um this has been enlightening for everybody myself obviously <laughs> you filled in a lot of stuff so uh thank you we love guitar nerds podcast mark chatfield you also are still kind of selling guitars yeah yeah i i i have a a hobby business now it's called trademark guitars i sold cowtown back in 2011 and uh kind of just did it as a hobby and it's still just a hobby i have Mm -hmm. i have no desire to open up a retail location Mm -hmm. and and i probably keep as much of the stuff that i buy as i resell the stuff that i buy i'd love to see your collection someday (laughs) well yeah it's it's always been a mask for my own collection all of it right you but yeah i I still do it because i know how to do it and it's and it's fun and it's a lot more fun when you don't have the overhead of a store right? <laughs> or the responsibility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I'll always keep my fingers in that. Yeah. Alrighty, alrighty. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Uh-huh. Bye. Bye-bye.